Okay, then we start the meeting with Jos Venn from Netherlands. Okay, thank you. I will. Uh, I would like to share my screen. Even kijken, there it goes. Okay. I made a little uh, PowerPoint uh, presentation to uh, show what it's all about. And in this case, I am, would like to talk about the air quality. Oh, oh sorry, my presentation disappears. Uh. Uh, okay. so, let's see. Oh, yeah, sorry, I'm a bit surprised that. Okay, uh, the air we breathe is loaded with uh, tiny particles made up of uh, chemicals, allergens, dust, smoke, or soil in the form of uh, microscopic solids, gases, or liquids. The particulates are atmospheric particulates, or sorry, at, or atmospheric particulates better, in short PM, are, separ are separated in a number of groupings, like PM05, PM1, PM2.5, PM4, and PM10. These groupings are summed up. So PM10 includes all particles with a diameter of 10 micrometer or less. See the wiki page for more information. The SPS30 is a calibrated optical particulate metal sensor that measures these particulates. The mass concentration is measured in micrograms per cubic meter for PM10, PM2.5, PM4, and PM1, I should say. The number concentrations is measured in the number of per cubic centimeter for all the previous particle measures, including PM.05, sorry, dot five. Also, the typical particle size is measured in micrometers. The SPS 30 has two inlets, one outlet and a fan inside to suck new air in. The data can be retrieved from a serial port or an I2C port. More information, is at the Ancestorian site, and that's also needed when you like to use that sensor. In a standalone configuration, I use, of course, an ESP32 breakout board, the SPS30, and a standard for the SPS30. A power supply is needed for uh, the SPS30, that needs 5 volt and the, S the ESP32 needs 3 volt. A female plug ZHR5 is also needed for my GST. Note this has a very small bus uh, contact. Just uh, we are watching only a black screen of your terminal, not, oh, uh, not the presentation, sorry. No presentation? No. Uh, that's terrible. Do you see my screen now? Is it still blank? I see your terminal, only the terminal with Patty. Oh. 
Hold on, I have a problem. Yeah, okay. Maybe, maybe uh, you, you just shared the single window. Could that be the case? Not the, not, not the entire screen. Oh, that is, uh, could be the case. Maybe. Yeah, if so, then you, you, well, uh, you, you need to stop sharing and then reshare the entire screen. Yeah, okay. now we have it. Oh, sorry. <laughs> yeah. Uh, okay, the first uh, sheet was about air quality. The next sheet was about the SPS 30. And the following sheet, that's going, that was about the SPS, uh, oh sorry, uh, the, the standard standalone configuration. And now I would like to talk about uh, the extensions for Seaford of Mitch Bradley. I made an extra serial port interface to communicate with the sensor. Also a driver for the sensor and a ring buffer to keep the data in. <clears throat> Measuring these particle particulates involves a little process. The first record is shown after 11 seconds and it's not very accurate. Then uh, after two cycles, the process uh, takes about three minutes for each cycle and that involves waking up the sensor, wait for the status register of the sensor. Then there is a warming up uh, sequence to get fresh air inside the sensor. Then uh, the sensor needs to take in five samples. On, and then the record is added to a ring buffer. The ring buffer can be shown on the web page. Then uh, the SPS 30 is uh, going in sleep mode. That takes about three minutes. And during the sleep mode, the current drops from 80 milliamps to 50 microamps. Other tasks at the same time, run a web server, communicate with the network, show what's going on, and allow interactions with the process. I'm now going to show you, to you the program. Do you see my terminal? Yes. Okay. I'm now going to, to uh, start the ESP32. <clears throat> the first action is to uh, start FreeTOS and FreeTOS runs CFORT. CFORT has been changed, so it starts and compiles applications when it is not interrupted. At this point, a web interface is compiled and is started. When it is uh, started, it shows to me the IP address of the web inter interface so I can browse to it. The next step is to detect the SPS 30 and show its data. Then a first measurement is taken. It is not yet complete, but it has been started. Then I pass the program in order to explain it, this uh, to you. While it was passed, the program also got the time and the date for my network that is needed to show the records in the right time. Now I will resume the program. And the program is now taking a number of uh, samples. Okay, these samples are added to a ring buffer. And the ring buffer is uh, shown in the web interface. I'm now switching to the web interface. Okay, I will stop and share it. This is the web interface, sorry. And as you see, it, there are already 
two records in the web interface. Even kijken. Oké, okay, bij resume de program. En I refresh the screen again. Oh, dat gaat natuurlijk verkeerd. Even kijken hoor. Deze stoppen. Ah. En hier, the, the new records are added. I can also go chart of these records. And as you see, the mass concentrations are shown for the various... Uh, Particle matters. Uh, okay. Normally, the difference between the various lines is very small, since these values are summed up. So that's the reason why you see a black line only here. In this case, I have speeded up the timings to sh uh, show the records in a speedy time. Otherwise, you wouldn't. Uh, Enjoy uh, this graphic. This all happens while uh, new records are added to the rank buffer. Okay. Now I'm going back to the presentation to uh, explain to you how a normal graphic uh, would uh, show up. Moment. Okay. There's a It's not right. Hmm. Uh, do you see my whole screen? Hello? Yeah, looks good. Okay. And do you see the PowerPoint again? Yep. Okay. Now I hope I can go to the last dia. Okay, there it is. <clears throat> well, here at uh, about, uh, I believe it was uh, late in the night, the PM10 starts at uh, 1.9. I hope you can read it because I. Nah. Okay, the PM10 starts, starts at uh, 1.9. Then um, at about uh, 1900, I decided I'm going to cook. And the PM10 went up to 15.30. That's actually a normal situation. Well, I can't. Uh, get a bigger screen, otherwise you could see there are indeed uh, four lines and one of them is red and that's just below the black line. Well, that is uh, actually how uh, the program uh, works. Um, it's all done in uh, CVOD, which runs on, on an uh, ESP32. Uh, are there any questions? Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you, Josh. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So, my question would be the, the modified version of C force and this Artos com combination. Do, do, do you have this available at some place, or did you do the change for your own? Oh. Uh, Seaford is uh, on the web. You can uh, mm -hmm. download it uh, sure. from the site of uh, Mitch Bradley. On my site, there is a uh, communication uh, program, and uh, that's free available. Mm -hmm. that's, uh, that program 
allows you to uh, transfer files to the ESP32 uh, in a very fast way. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, uh, the problem is this program is that it depends on uh, my network. Um, so it is a bit hard to uh, use it in, on another uh, system. However, mm -hmm. I have also another program that uh, measures the outside uh, temperature and that does not have uh, that problem yet. And I'm uh, willing to share it uh, on my uh, site, but uh, that still needs uh, some work. And then mm -hmm. you will be able to use the graphics, the web uh, interface, and uh, now, yeah, the whole thing. Mm -hmm. But that will yeah. take some yeah. time uh, before it is so far. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Excellent. Then uh, we we I cannot see Christian, who normally has uh, many questions, <laughs> but who can uh, replace Christian? I said Pablo. He can make some questions to Joss, please. Or Fitz, Fitz, <laughs> make some questions. I I see a new face in the group, William Watson. Hello, William. You are in London. Nice, nice to see you. Are you a forder? You used used to program in force. Hello. Uh, yeah, I uh, the last time I looked at Forth was about thirty years ago, uh, and I worked for a firm that sold Forth Inks Forth in the UK. And I think the, one of the last things I did was to demo and sell the Novix chip that Chuck Moore designed. Mm -hmm. Great, great. It so was. it was an amazing chip. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Mm -hmm. I think I think it had no pro the interrupt was broken on it, and I did some kind of uh, comparator that could detect the interrupt code and then sort of uh, enforce an interrupt in hardware. It, it it wasn't a proper interrupt, but it faked it, and mm -hmm. I then mm -hmm. left that world to uh, work in civil engineering. Very different. Mm -hmm. so, but I, I'm a fan of. Uh, ESP32s and all of that kind of thing. And now I'm retired. Uh, I'm back doing stuff with them. And uh, I stumbled on uh, probably some posting of yours, Peter, and uh, thought I'd have a look in and see what the world is like now from the fourth point of view. Wonderful, <laughs> wonderful. Then uh, we have any more questions from uh, Jason or Dimitri or Frank? Do you have any questions to Josh? No, <laughs> no. Then we can follow with the next um, speaker. Uh, regrettably, Brad did not make it to the to the meeting, so we continue. Uh, let me share the screen. Uh, we have a uh, next participant is Bill Raxdale with number to text conversion. So. Bill, go ahead, please. Good, right, thank you, gentlemen. Let us go to share screen. And that looks good to me. Hope it looks good to you. So our project today is um, taken from one of the uh, uh, Silicon Valley fourth challenges some months ago. And uh, the goal is to um, imagine that we are doing the front end for a speech output system, not the speech output itself, but the front end. So we want to translate, in this case, numbers to text, and then the speech conversion will convert to an audible form. So as a quick demonstration, we want to be able to convert the integers from zero to 100. So the steps I went through first uh, worked out a, a um, case structure, had to go back and refresh my understanding of it, the quirks of it. Then we process by decades. Each decade seems to have its own characteristics. 
from uh, the zero zero decade to uh, 99 to 100. And then we're going to find one of the key exceptions is the difference between the number 90 and 91 or the even tens and beyond. And the key here is that if we're saying the number 91, we say 90 and then one, but the number, even number 90 is not said 90 zero. If it was consistent, we'd be saying 90 zero, but uh, of course we do not. And then there are special handling for the numbers 10 to 19. And finally, we want to be able to detect an out of range error. I had a couple of ahas on this project. The first one is that I'm using Win32 fourth, and it has a, quite a rich selection of string comparison, string analysis, and so on, but it does not have string concatenation. And so I searched through over and over and over saying, why is there no string concatenation? So I finally had to write one. And this actually was the most time consuming uh, part of the process because I wrote it four different times. Yeah, as we do in fourth, I wrote it once and it, it, it worked. And then I realized I had a couple of logical flaws. And so I rewrote it, rewrote it, rewrote it. And uh, so in this case, we have two input strings. They're counted strings. One is at address one, the other is located at address two. And then at address three is a workspace that has to be at least as large as the two strings concatenated. And I'm really very happy with what I came up with. Uh, it, it's uh, amazingly uh, compact, amazingly terse. So building on that, the first element was to handle units. So um, we have an input number coming in and we uh, do a 10 mod on it, which gets us what the, uh, the units are. And then using a case statement, we can convert this to a string. So uh, the case of zero gives us the pure text Z-E-R-O, all the numbers up through seven, eight, nine, and at the uh, integer value of nine, we would get the pure text of nine. And at the bottom is uh, uh, a, uh, an abort signal in case there's a uh, translation error, which should, should not occur, technically shouldn't occur. The, uh, the second decade is from 10 to 19. And in English, most of these have the uh, number with a teen added at the end. Number zero, of course, is said just as 10. Then we have 11, 12, and 13. Uh, notice 13 is not 13. It's 13. So that's a special case. With 14, we can just use the number four and then add teen on the end. So coming into this, the units has already been converted. So in this case, we use the, uh, the word add teen. And we look above and see that uh, add dot teen uh, takes, uh, it does the units and then it brings in the string of teen. So at this point, there are two strings on the stack. The, uh, there's a string, uh, the, the addresses of the string. There's one of them, which is the, uh, the address of the units portion and then the address of the teen portion. And later these will be concatenated together. So uh, at the, uh, toward the end, we see 18 would be the number eight and added teen, nine is uh, number nine and then adding teen. So now we are looking at the decades, the higher decades, like in the 20s, 30s, 40s, and 15s. In this case, we have to allow for this quirk that, uh, for example, you see in the comments there, we say, we're building a hyphenated number like uh, 91. So we say 90 and then append to it one. But if the, um, it's an even 90, then we just use the word 90 itself. So that little if then else uh, handles the detection of an even decade. So at the bottom, we see that 90 yields 90, 91. Uh, uh, yields the, the uh, text string 91. And this logic, of course, is applied at each decade, uh, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, and so on. Now we're getting a wrapper that begins to do all the decades. So we bring the number in. First, the, uh, the dupe 100 greater than is an error check to see if we're out of range. As long as we're in range, we take our input number, we divide by 10, and this gets us into the decade. So at this point, we know are we be, uh, between uh, 
uh, zero and nine, between uh, 10 and 19, and so on, up to 90 to 99. If we get a uh, quotient of exactly 100, that means we've divided 100 by 10 and we get 10. And so this just gives us the uh, string 100. If we get a nine, this tells us in the 90 decade. And so we get a, uh, the C quote gives us the, the prefix 90, and then we do the decade. So then we apply the, uh, uh, that uh, decade function, which gets us handling between zero and nine. So we work down all the way to the bottom at uh, the, the three decade prefix is <clears> 30, <throat> the decade prefix is a 20. And now when we get down to one and zero, we have special conversions that do the tens and do the units. So with a case statement, it becomes very systematic. We have to handle each of three special cases, but it all glues together quite well. This is the overall wrapper. The uh, convert dot one in green, you see, converts one decimal number. The uh, all dot decades does the translation for all of the decades. The output text concatenated uh, moves the two strings concatenated together into the output text. So all decades gets us two input strings. The output text concatenate joins them together and puts them into a workspace. And then finally, output text count type displays the output. Finally, we put a do loop around it. So we set the range from zero to 100, which is done by 101, zero do. The i4.r2 spaces, this formats the number we're converting. And then we do the single conversion, convert one. And this is done then 100 times. And now we see example of how it actually operates. So this is the live output. The uh, previous wrapper text gives us, takes, uh, you know, the first case is the number zero and it outputs Z-E-R-O. We go down, down the column down to nine. Then we are handling the first decade uh, or the second decade from 10 to 19. And of course it operates correctly. And now we're into the big numbers and you see that uh, 20 converts properly. It doesn't give us a 20 zero, it gives us 20. And then 21 down through 29. And as an example, the last decade is 90 down to our final, final number of 100. And the okay at the end lets us know this is we're done by four. <clears throat> now in the next slide, we're going to see the actual voice output. And I wanna point out, I did not do a voice output conversion routine. We did the text conversion, and then I fed this into an online voice conversion system. So we can actually hear what it would sound like. 100, okay. So the uh, the, the front end we've written does front end properly do the text conversion that would then later be converted into sound. Now the next case is in Spanish. I said, well, if we did this conversion in English, uh, let's look at it and see what it would be like in Spanish. Now that second decade from 10 to 19, it has the most irregularity into it. So that's the one I did in Spanish. And I found out that uh, the, once I had this overall routine done, Adding the Spanish conversion took about two minutes. The entire application, what with all the details I did, maybe it was four hours. But the by the by the time I got that whole code done, bringing it into Spanish took this decade took like two minutes. So uh, the code is quite portable. And we saw again, Spanish has uh, the uh, similar characteristics of English, where the tens are are, are uh, done by. Uh, Yes, once, dos, and trece, catorce, quince are all special words. Then from 16 to 19 is 16, 17, 18, and 19 are all done by taking 10 and 6, 10 and 7, 10 and 8, 10 and 9. So there is Spanish, and now we'll hear the Spanish translation. 
10, 10, 11, 11, 12, 12, 13, 13, 14, 14, 15, 15, 16, 16, 17, 17, 18, 18, 19, 19. And very good, it does work. So in summary, uh, the programming took more effort than I thought. I thought this was going to be kind of a little quick thing and just type it out and type the code the first time through, it's going to work. Well, I found out due to the irregularities in, in language, uh, there were more special cases than I realized. And the big aha, as I mentioned, was that Win32 fourth has no string concatenate. And so I actually spent the most time on that. And um, as I said, I rewrote it four times until I got one that I was really satisfied with. We see that there are many irregularities in the low numbers. And I guess our children, and we learn by memorization, uh, we certainly don't have the algorithm in our head on how we do a difference between 11 and 17. And I guess non-English speakers, I don't know how they learn. I guess, I don't know how they learn it. They just, they just learn it. And finally, uh, in voice response, the voice response system that I used online handled the hyphen properly because proper English would be to write numbers uh, like 21 as 20 hyphen one. But if you're doing a real speech input translation, the hyphen would, hyphen would not be present. So here's a postscript. This is a little, a little wrap, a little uh, conclusion. After I thought back on this, um, back in the early days of FIG, we did the, um, the FIG implementation workshop. And one of our members was Mike O'Malley. In 1975, he was doing speech research at the University of California. And he was a consultant to Texas Instruments and, and uh, guided them on their original Speak and Spell. The Speak and Spell was the very first game toy that did natural language output. So you could put in uh, words, you could type in uh, numbers, you could do math, and you could play some word games. Uh, it was all on a portable uh, uh, basis, about the same size as a uh, normal tablet today. And so, as I remember right, his fee on this for the consulting work and transferring rights to, he had patented some of this. And so allowing them to use the patents and his consulting, I believe he got a fee of a million and a half dollars, which is about $8 million today. So at that point, uh, Mike was pretty well off. So he retired. And then within the fourth interest group, he developed the Texas Instruments 9900 Big Fourth implementation. And I did note uh, subsequent to that, uh, about another 10 years later, he and his wife purchased the Berkeley Daily Planet newspaper. At that point, it was a, a print newspaper and it was kind of struggling, but the two of them became benefactors. They bought it, uh, they continued it as a print newspaper sometimes, and now it's gone in line. So it is uh, an online newspaper and it's currently going quite strongly. So we can see how fourth technology can become practical, can be monetized, and it can lead to a good retirement. So do we have any questions? Good. I Amazing, see, Bill, very. Silent, so that is fine by me. <laughs> I did not know about this anecdote. It's really interesting that force can be behind so much technology. Mm -hmm. I ask a oh, question. Thank you. thank you for your rapt attention. Uh, we have a good, very good group today. Glad to see all you people, 28 people here. That's a very good turnout, very good. And Bill, uh, just uh, did you say that next time you're going to present the actual text to speech conversion and forth? You're going to do that for us? <laughs> I, I, I don't have the $1.5 million to fund that. <laughs> and I, I do stand in very high regard for the technology. Uh, to me, it's a mystery and a, a black art out there on how in the world you generate the waveforms to form natural speech. Uh, that, I haven't certainly researched it at all, but I, I think the people doing that work, Google and the rest, I should get the highest compliment for being able to generate natural speech. It's amazing. Yeah. 
I, I think you probably, um, uh, I, I remember doing a oh, long time ago, wave, wave files basically, but in just in flash or whatever we had back then. But it would be so easy to have a whole vocabulary on, on, on SD card file, that, you know, and then ha have the variations of those for connecting them up. It wouldn't be probably as good, but it should do a fairly good job anyway. So yes, that might be a challenge. I might put that down as a challenge. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Thank you much, Bill. Well, uh, did you see, probably Bill does not know, but one of the things I saw uh, on, the, on the YouTube channels on these uh, scientists and makers is um, an artificial tongue and an artificial um, uh, uh, mechanics uh, to create voice, but, but completely mechanics. So there is a blower and there is a mouse in, 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 um, in rubber, in soft rubber, and there are servo motors uh, that, that make the, the form of the voice to create a real uh, speech to create real speech, not over electronics, but over a robot, a robot. Very interesting, Peter. Mm -hmm. Well, if you I wanted have... to get back to the, if you want to get back to the basis, the fundamental basis there, where you have a, a mechanical method to generate voice, then I would insist that it be powered by steam because we would like to have steam powered <laughs> voice generation. <laughs> Uh, but it's been proven hot air works really well. Okay, then if uh, we we have uh, new members in the group and more shit, where are you in the world? If you want to say hello to the group, Abdenavi, more shit, Abdenavi. If I if my pronunciation is not correct, sorry, I don't. If you can hear me, more sh more kit or more kit up up the navi. Hmm? Well, he's not more in the meeting. But okay, then we follow. I don't know, Ulrich, if you want to present the next. <laughs> sure. Uh, so somehow somehow we have some issues getting people uh uh connecting to the conference so so we're still waiting for brad and also we just contacted klaus schleisig uh so that he will join uh, us and um, uh, as always you could just connect with zoom.forth2020.org um, but uh, he's also not uh, here yet so we uh, skip him as well and hopefully can uh, hear the talk afterwards which would mean that atle uh, would be the one to present next so atle are you prepared uh, right now to do that i have a microphone does it work yeah yes it works and so if yes. you want to then please go ahead all right thank you i've, I've found a way to do this um yes, now let it does. Me... <laughs> Uh, let me just see if I can, uh, do you see the fourth mobile on the floor? Yes. Okay. Loud, loud and clear. Excellent. Um, then I can share, um, then I can share a window here. Uh, this one. Uh -huh. And now, if I am lucky, you should see my screen, and you should see the Ford Mobile in the in the uh, upper right corner. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Excellent. Okay. So, if you look at this uh, at this document, then uh, you'll see how it's built. So, it's it's built around a, a motor controller, some sensors, uh, some. Um, some uh, pulse counters, some laser uh, laser rangers, a compass, and this board that I've shown you before. This uh, this uh, ESP thirty two super expander that I call it. Uh, so I'm just going to show the overview of how 
this software works. Um, it has a, a, a low level, uh, a low level part and a high level part. So the the low level part interacts with all the various doodads that are connected to um, to the super expander. Uh, for example, for motor control, uh, for um, um, uh, these registers that that uh, control whether it goes forwards, backwards. Uh, it also um, uh, generates PWM values so that I can vary speeds. There are um, different ways of, of of turning. For example, I can I can turn by uh, running half the wheels forward and the wheels on the other side backwards, or I can block one set of wheels and run the others, or I can just adjust the speeds. That will that will um, that will change the way that it um, uh, that it turns. Uh, so, and uh, then for distance, I measure distance in in millisecond travel at speed one hundred and fifty. But in order to find out how far that is, I can just go for for that time and measure. And I found it to be about um, uh, 30 centimeters if I if I run it at one second uh, at speed 150. So this this is the data that I'm uh, that I'm gathering and the uh, control parameters that I use uh, in order to manipulate the board. Then in order to drive around, I have this uh, I have this state machine here. So normally it will be driving, and when it's driving, it will adjust. If it sees an obstacle uh, on the left, it will turn slightly to the right, and if it uh, sees it on the other side, it will turn the other way, etc. If it sees an obstacle uh, in front of it, then it will go to a different state that's called obstructed. Then it will stop. It will try to back out. It will uh, it will turn the uh, the laser rangers, it will activate the, the servos and look around for, for a way out. Uh, and uh, this latest addition is um, a state that, uh, that says that it's off course, that I've, that I've, uh, I've staked out a course for it. And then uh, it looks at the compass to see if it's on course. And if it's badly off course, then it will go to this uh, different state. Uh, now, the way it is right now, these two states, of course, and obstructed, they will fight each other. Uh, so it will it will try to get back on course. There will be an obstacle. It will turn away from its course, uh, etc. That's something that I have to uh, fix later on. Uh, and uh, the way I'll do that is that I'll I'll have two courses. One course that is set an, an intermediate course that can lead around these obstacles uh, and um, uh, then I will have an, an overall uh, course so it, it will be a, a, instead of being one course it, it will be a, an array of course segments that might lead around the obstacles that it finds uh, but that's uh, I'm, I'm not I'm not quite there yet uh, but I am ready to uh, share another screen. Uh, now, let me see here. Uh, and then I will share this one. Uh, now, uh, if I do this, now Atle, we see only your um, black terminal. You uh, you don't see uh, you don't see text on a, uh, on a black background. Yes, yes, the text, but we 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 have uh, lost the the small the fourth mobile. Oh, it's not. It's no longer okay. Then I'll go back and uh, uh, 
see if I can stop the video and then start it again. Do you no, see it? yes. Okay. Yes. Oh, all right. Then I will try to uh, try to execute this again. Do you see it going? Do you see it turning? No, not it's moving for me. Not moving. Static. No. Now it's moving. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, yes. Okay. So um, I can uh, I can see uh, now the desired course is one five seven. The actual course is one five nine. And it's turning left. It shouldn't. Uh, in fact, it shouldn't do that. It it should go. It should go straight ahead when it's when there's so little difference between it. But anyway, um, I can I can run for uh, for say five seconds. Uh, and uh, then I, I need to uh, and see how it likes that. Yeah. So now, now it went off in that direction for five seconds. Uh, I can see if I can get it to come back. Uh, and see if we're still on, on course. Yes. So. Uh, uh, let's see if we can run into an, an obstacle. We have the same desired course, but I will uh, turn right. So that it, it's pointing in a different direction than, uh, than the one it should be going in and then see if I can run it for 15 seconds. And you see now it's now it's trying to find uh, find its course, but it's cracking into something, and uh, it probably yeah. So uh, <laughs> so the way this works is. If if I if I give it this command gear backwards, then it will go backwards uh, forever. So I need to give it explicit uh, explicit uh, uh, order to stop, but I need to uh, give milliseconds because otherwise it will just uh, stop immediately. Now it should go backwards for fifteen on fifteen hundred milliseconds, and it. Did but it uh, it's it's got it we its wheels tangled up in something. I will see if I can help it. Oh yeah. Oh oh man. Oh it managed it managed to wedge itself under that furniture. That's why it didn't move. Okay. Uh yeah. Uh, uh let's see if we can try it again uh, so. of course and now we run for 15 seconds to see if it can get back on course it did so it, it found its course and now it's off it's going up towards the entrance door. And that's, yeah. Oh, now it's, now it's collided with the entrance door. I see that uh, if, you, if, you, if you look at the log here, you see that it's obstructed. It's trying to back up and trying to find, uh, it's trying to find a way through the entrance door now. That's uh, basically, that is the, the, the status of this, uh, of this project as it is now. Uh, let's see if I can get my ugly mug back on the screen. Uh, and that's it. That's uh, that's the status of the fourth mobile. All the 
Uh, Very good. Uh, Fantastic. Yeah. The documentation and uh, and uh, uh, code and everything is up on is up on GitHub, and uh, Peter has uh, has given me access so I can put it up on on uh, on the fourth uh, website as well as soon as when 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 it's good enough to to go there I will put it there. Yeah, thank you. I, I think I think Rob Provin and William Overkirk are the specialists here in robotics, together with Joss, of course, and Ulrich and every, every everyone else. But probably Rob and William can give you some feedback. Very good. Love it. More robots, the better. Yeah. Yeah, I'm I'm, I'm trying to I, I will be attempting to um uh, to to uh, draw a map for it and and try to implement the the a star algorithm for for going into the kitchen and coming back yeah. again yes yeah good i Look have one to question it. um so would it be reasonable instead of uh, giving times to do the movements uh talking about distances and angles like uh, turn 90 degrees to the to the right Yes, well, I I did something horrible when I designed that um, uh, that uh, PCB. I left. Um, I I have some 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 registers that are cascaded, so the serial in uh, on one goes to uh, or the out from one goes to in on the next one, etc. It's just that on the first one I forgot to ground it, so it's shifting in random bits. Uh, which makes it, which uh, makes all the uh, all the the data that I that I get for for the status of, of the wheels it's garbled. So I have a, a new board that's coming in now uh, in a few days, uh, and also I will I will uh, I will uh, uh, solder a little uh, strap onto onto this board to just ground that uh, input. And then mm -hmm. I will be able to measure distances more accurately. Yeah, so then you would measure back the turning of the wheels uh, so that yes. you can do closed loop control there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What, yeah. What, Great. What, what type of encoder do you have on the on the robot? Remind me. I think I've looked at your robot before, but. Uh, I have this. Uh, I think I should even have one here. Those are the those are uh, IR. Um, IR encoders with a so there's there's a there's a slit in uh, in the wheel and and uh, every time there's an uh, it passes through this opening then uh, I get a pulse. Okay. And, yep. And yep. these pulses uh, then go into a, a forty twenty counter. Yeah. Uh, and they are being stored there, and that forty twenty counter is then. Connected to a, a, a fire um, a one six five register that shifts it into uh, shifts it into the ESP thirty two, so okay. that I can I can Good. read this whenever I want. So I don't I don't have any interrupts or anything like that. I just read the values. Yeah. yeah. So, something I want to remark uh, that Atle uh, created his own board from nothing. Oh, he had no electronics knowledge one year mm -hmm. ago. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. He had no knowledge of force one year ago. He prints with a 3D printer many parts of this kit. He makes the Java interface. He made the um, he talks to the fourth mobile over a, a own design of a, of a of a terminal. So I would like to know more Atlas. We have only one in the group. And yes. if someone, <laughs> if someone knows more Atlas, we will be very happy. <laughs> very yeah. impressive. Mm -hmm. Indeed. But yeah, with right. robots, often you're dealing with mechanics, electronics, software, real-time exactly. software, and it's it's uh, it's hard. Uh, obviously, you know, I'm involved in a robotics group, and um, it's difficult for beginners to do everything. That's the problem. You know, you have to mm -hmm. do mechanics, mm -hmm. you have to understand inertia. I mean, it's just, it's a, but it's an interesting, it's very interesting. 
Mm-hmm. Yes, I mean, I, I was always a, a, a Java programmer. I was I was programming, uh, you know, uh, uh, the administrative software. And and when I when I put a value somewhere, that value was there and there. Uh, it didn't. Uh, there, there were there were no voltage levels or nothing that could could burn or blow up or or, <laughs> or crash or anything. Yeah, the worst thing that could happen would be some kind of uh, exception, and then I could just go in uh, with a debugger and find out what it was that I did wrong. Mm-hmm. Uh, so the level of catastrophe that can happen here has has made me more disciplined. I, I look mm-hmm. a lot closer at my code now than than what I used to do. Yeah, I, I think uh, Francois want to um, to build uh, one of these kits, and probably Christian Hinze. I know that Josh Venn has also one of these uh, robots, these uh, smart cars. Mm-hmm. Well, I, I think the, the interesting thing that we saw in your demo, thank you very much, Atle, is uh, the interactive nature of force. So if you compare this with uh, the way that you would program the robot using C, for, for example, uh, uh, yeah, then it wouldn't be as easy. You would have to pro- program some kind of command loop that you can press F to go forward or it asks yeah. you for the number. This is all what gets uh, us for free with the auto interpreter. Uh, so, so showing uh, and exploring uh, things in this uh, cyber physical thing, yeah, where you have hardware to control, where you have software and uh, also, if you're doing electronic development, it's the same thing that you can uh, actuate parts of the circuitry and figure out what's going on. Um, so that's, I think this is where force shines. But also what we saw is the drawbacks that uh, force has uh, in that, um, uh, well, you missed milliseconds. You said 1,500 stop. And uh, so if we do errors, we see them immediately, which might be nice, but the damage could be serious. And um, so there is no safety net. And uh, uh, I think that's uh, something that uh, we we need to think about. Also, Bill said that uh, writing the string append routine was more work than he expected. Well, as being an old force programmer that surprised me, of course, uh, but it's the same experience that others tell me as well. They, In the end, it's nice program and it looks like force, that's great, but it's not as easy as it should be. And I think that's, uh, we as a community can think about uh, this. Uh, so, so how could uh, errors uh, that uh, Atle did by demonstrating, how can we avoid this uh, to, to make things uh, uh, not catastrophic, catastrophic uh, if, if we mistype. So I know it's crash early, crash often, so that you learn about your programs, but I think that's not always a good option. I'm, I'm not so sure. Uh, I'm not so sure, in fact, that we, that we should be protected from, from all of this. Uh, because it does something to the way we think. You know, when, when I look at Bill Ragsdale's, mm-hmm. uh, uh, it, it's like watching poetry. You know, mm-hmm. it's curse, <laughs> it's beautiful, it's, it's, uh, uh, the, the, it's the only most logical way of, of dealing with a problem. Uh, and and uh, if, we, if we were protected and guided and 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 uh, babied around uh, like we are with with these uh, Java IDs, we 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 don't. We, I I don't think we will be able to fully realize our true potential. So so fourth is also it's it's a form of meditation. Mm-hmm. Uh, it, it's a balance that you have to take. So I I would propose to to have like something like IntelliJ for for force. Uh, to, to uh, shield you from everything that could go wrong. But there, there is probably some middle ground. In, instead of crashing the robot or burning the circuitry uh, because you, you just mistyped something. Uh, yeah, so, so you, you, of course you, you can and you will and you want to shoot yourself in the foot in some way. Uh, and and uh, this will always be the case and uh, yeah. So, but if we have techniques to, to do what we want, that, that would be great. And if things yeah. are really getting simpler. 
you could do, you could use uh, the catch and throw uh, mechanics of Ford, and then you can uh, catch a lot of errors. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. For sure. But that keeps a problem when you, you're using hardware. Exactly. Mm -hmm. So you have mm -hmm. to do uh, some kind of uh, decouple uh, couple it with the, with the software, measure the current or something like that. Mm -hmm. so yes. you can yeah. keep the system safe. Yeah. Yeah, to, to prevent uh, crashes, I, I have all these uh, I have all these uh, IR sensors that ideally should be should be mounted all around it, and I also have some tilt sensors, and I can I can plug all these uh, onto the board. But I but I realize I I forgot something. Don Golding has been speaking about um, uh, when he's speaking about his his triune uh, operating system that. Not all of this should go to the CPU. Some of it should go directly to uh, whatever powers the wheels. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that's that's probably something I'm going to change when when there's a uh, well, uh, war coming up. I I am I am uh, the lawyer of Atle, and I will come to his defense. I will defend my my customer. Uh, <laughs> this is very easy to resolve, uh, and I will uh, advise him after the meeting to make a small cradle to um, put this Ford Mobile. It's not necessary to run in the ground, but he can he can touch the sensors from from the distance because he has a laser sensors, mm -hmm. and he can show, see the wheel spinning in the right direction, etc. When everything is is okay, then he puts the force mobile on the ground and it will run. Yeah, yeah. This, yeah. this is no not a big a big a problem, but my, uh, Atlas problem is because he makes everything. He was uh, uh, a couple of days ago. Uh, with the PCB board problems, so he must solder and find the cold, the cold solder, and this kind of problems. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. But but mm -hmm. I I think this project is fantastic for the community. In a for couple sure. of months of months, this will run like uh, butter. Yeah, great. So, are there any other comments or questions to Atle? Well, um, um, uh, Murshid had um, had a question in the chat here. Ah, uh, right. Yeah. Uh, well, the the it it won't it won't um, it, it won't heat up. It will it will simply run out of battery. If I took this out on the football field and let it go uh, and uh, uh, lost contact with it, it will it, it would it would uh, run until it was out of batteries, but it wouldn't overheat. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All right. And then there's uh, another question that he asks uh, is like, uh, uh, why you didn't, don't use a camera? Uh, uh, and, the, and, 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 but. Mm -hmm. I, I have, I have a, a, a project on, uh, with uh, with a Raspberry Pi on the Kadas Wim Wim um, uh, that is powerful enough to be able to interpret uh, data from a camera. Um, the the ESP thirty uh, two and ha have have the ESP thirty two interpret the data that it sees. It's it it's really on the brink of what it can do. It mm -hmm. can recognize objects, etc., but but to be able to process this in real time, I wouldn't do that with an ESP32, but with a Raspberry Pi, yes. Okay, great. I would say so. Thank you very much, uh, Atle, again. Uh, looking forward to the progress of your robot. And we see it blinking in your background. That's so great. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Wonderful. So I'm happy that uh, I can say welcome to Klaus. Thank you very much for joining us. And Klaus will be our next, uh, give us our next talk uh, on FPGA for CPU microcore and its real world applications. So Klaus, are you prepared to share your screen or slides? Do you hear me? Yes. Okay. Yes, I'm sharing my screen. Let's see. This is what I want to share. 
Okay. So, do you see my PPT presentation? Yes. Okay. So, microcore applications. Um, in retrospect, I would say uh, I should have done this uh, as a first presentation because this, I think, gives a lot of motivation and also gives you a better idea of what microcore can be used for. Because, after all, it is a very high performance uh, force engine. Uh, anyway, so let's start. This is the list of major applications I have been doing over a period of, altogether, well, let's say 15 years or so. And I go through them uh, uh, project by project. Uh, the green numbers uh, to the right are the types of F. PGAs I'm using. And since this is all uh, a while ago, these are all 90, 90 nanometer technologies, which means they are quite old. But anyways, they are big enough for microcore and additional stuff that is needed by the application. Uh, Geolon MCS. This is an offshore seismic data logger and uh, offshore means besides the XYZ axis of uh, geophones, we also have the uh, hydrophone pressure, the so-called Z component. So this is actually a four channel data logger. And this is also the reason why commercial land seismic recorders cannot be used for this purpose. And this is, well, it, it's, it's not very complicated. We have 24-bit digitizers, um, and we have a very, very high precision time base uh, that is not allowed to consume any power. This is a contradiction. But there is, in the US, there is a French guy who specialized on these time, kinds of time bases, and he gets a precision without heating with and, and with a crystal oscillator of 1.5 seconds per year, which is excellent and good enough for the seismic data loggers. And the time base is important because Several data loggers are deployed on the ocean bottom uh, for one experiment. And later on, when you correlate the signals, you are dependent on the precise timing to, to get uh, the correlation right. The digitizer fills uh, for megabyte buffer. And whenever the buffer is almost full, it is written out to a disk. And the disk can be read. Uh, at the time when I did this, it was not clear that uh, that um, ah, um, how do you call the 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 the, the technology of Microsoft? Anyway, it was not clear which was the quickest. And at the time, the four hundred megabit per second firewire was uh, was the uh, proper choice. And nobody would know that, know that this is going to die. So this is a block diagram. And this is how it looks like. Um, there is uh, the uh, Xilinx FPGA in, in the very center. Uh, you don't see it in the picture. And uh, it runs microcore. And one of the nice things is the the, 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 the type of data compression I'm doing, it's uh, um, here you see the actual high level code of encoding a single sample. Oops, what happened? Uh, to encoding a single sample. And if the thing runs at, well, let's say one kilo sample per second times four channels, um, this is clear that this is a bottleneck. And by realizing these uh, one, two, three, four, five instructions, uh, functions as microcore instructions, the whole encode game can be reduced to this expression, which is dramatically more uh, quicker. So with this, we were able to do the one kilo samples per second uh, sampling rates. 
The next project is the ultra wide dynamic range ADC. Um, it has 150 dB dynamic range, uh, which uh, usually you would say this is not possible, but the way we did this is um, the hydrophone and the geophones, they always feed two channels. Uh, to then the amplification of these channels are different and I, I skip ahead and show you. Now this is what the two different ADCs do. There is one that is an 18 bit A to D, which is very sensitive. And then later on, there is also in parallel a 16 bit ADC that it has a much lower sensitivity. And here you see the combined action of the, the so-called fine uh, ADC and the coarse ADC. And uh, as a matter of fact, when the seismic signals are evaluated, what is really important are the faint signals. So usually we are only in this region and sometimes uh, the boat that makes the noises passes a seismic station, in which case we get into this region, but then the resolution is not that important. So this is the block diagram. We have two channels uh, for the hydrophone, two channels for the geophone. And then we have, uh, again, a Xilinx XC2V250 that combines all these channels and especially the, 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 the uh, most computing power of the FPGA is taken by uh, finite impulse response filters that produce a different sampling rates because these ADCs work at, uh, at, at, at standard uh, speeds and always the same. And so the reduction of the sampling rates is uh, being done by uh, low pass decimation filtering. Um, and here you see a real, I mean, this is real data that has been taken and you see, yes, uh, we were able to make the, in the, in the fine channel, we were able to do the 150 uh, dB dynamic range. And, and, and here you see the noise signals of 50 Hertz and the third overtone of the 50 Hertz as noise signals, which if you work in a, in a urban, environment, there is no way around these noises, but of course, on the ocean bottom, they are not present. So that uh, was an enhancement of the Geolon MCS with an extended dynamic range. Uh, the next project is uh, SUGAR. Don't, SUGAR is an uh, acronym and I don't remember what it stands for, but in any event, this was a large project that kept us busy for uh, more than a year. Uh, there is a boat and the boat has a coatial tow cable, which in this case was seven kilometers long. And then comes a, they call it a pick here in this picture. So this, this is a larger structure, which you don't see here either. Oh no, this, this is the, 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 the heart of it. Uh, this is a pressure, a titanium pressure housing with all kinds of electronics in it. So this is in this part. And then comes the streamer, which is a chain of hydrophone pressure, and compass information. With the pressure, you determine how deep uh, the uh, hydrophone housing is uh, immersed in the water, and it is precise enough to detect differences of more than one meter. So you can see whether this is a straight line or if there are wiggles in it, and that is all important when you evaluate the seismic signals. The compass is needed in order to see whether if, if you look from above, whether it goes in a straight line or has, if, if the, the ship makes a turn, then this is of course no longer a straight line. So you see this from the compass and uh, the hydrophone actually is 
uh, responsible for the types of signals that are supposed to be picked up. And uh, yeah, this, this is a large uh, setup. And here you see some components. These are, these are the streamer nodes. Uh, here you see an opening and, and behind the opening is a hydrophone and they are all interconnected. And uh, the data is collected. There's always, a, 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 I believe it was a 10 megabit per second frame that traveled from the last node towards the receiving station here. And the receiving was done by this uh, PC board with an FPGA on it and, and uh, microcore. And, and basically what it did, it converted the serial stream that came in, converted it into 24-bit entities for the uh, hydrophones, and then it would send these, the, the FPGA and microcore would send uh, these signals uh, to a bottom PC, which uh, was quick enough for this purpose. And this one did two things. It stored all the data that was collected on a, a fixed disk and a selection of up to, I believe it was 10 hydrophone nodes or so, immediately shipped it to the boat for inspection by the crew that was observing it. And here, for instance, you see the uh, modem that would uh, receive the uh, the TCP IP signal from the uh, PC here and sent it uh, a couple, and, 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 and this unit here couples these signals into the uh, tow cable and, and that bridges the seven kilometers to the boat. And uh, here in this example, we used a lattice FPGA, the X P2-17, which turned out to be large enough. The next project is the Korean Ocean Bottom System. Since we had the know-how how to operate uh, on the ocean floor, um, it was more or less easy for us to get a foot in the tsunami warning uh, market after the big uh, tsunami in Indonesia when all of the large companies in the world didn't have anything to offer and, and we could quickly come up with a solution. Um, and so this was built on an island in the Japanese sea off, off the coast, I think about 80 kilometers off the coast of uh, South Korea. Uh, there was a meteorological station on the island and that uh, kept all the equipment uh, on land uh, that was necessary to operate the system. Then there was a land cable to a beach hole uh, and in the beach hole the land cable was coupled to the uh, underwater cable um to connect to the ocean bottom unit as we called it uh, that had the electronics and the sensors uh, well the major sensor of this installation is a pressure sensor uh, of uh, pyroscientific in i think they are in uh, located in seattle as far as i remember and it has an unbelievable precision so in a water depth of 3000 meter, you could detect changes in the water level of five millimeter. And this turned out to be sufficient to find uh, tsunami events. As a matter of fact, in the area that the system was operating, the tide, the, 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 the tides uh, wave was about 40 centimeters and on these 40 centimeters, an irregularity of two or three centimeters uh, constituted a tsunami event. And, and that, of course, needed to be detected uh, with appropriate algorithms. And these algorithms were here running on the land station. Um, 
the laying the sea cable was quite an experience. So this uh, was an opportunity in my life to uh, work on a cable laying ship. And that, that, that was uh, very interesting. Um, here are some components. Uh, this is the ocean bottom unit uh, photographed on the seafloor. Um, this is the ocean bottom unit uh, on board before deployment. And the thing about optical cables is in an optical cable, you have uh, fibers and only one conductor because the fibers are contained. In our case, we used a very advanced optical fiber that kept the optical fibers in a copper tube. And so the copper tube was the actual electrical conductor, but there was only one. So the, feed, the, 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 the current that went, had to go back uh, to, the, uh, to the beach, well, that had to go through the water. And so you're, here you see the combined system and the electrical situation. Uh, we built a current, a constant current source of 460 milliamps, and then already the land cable was uh, 63 ohms, five kilometers, and then the 20 kilometer sea cable was another 31 ohms. So these all incurred losses uh, on the way to the OBU. So here we lost 29 volts, here we lost 14, and the OBU itself consumed 12.7 volts. And then the return was uh, from an, oops, from an electron throat on the OBU, which is the cathode, because uh, the, the anode more or less disintegrates and we didn't want anything to disintegrate uh, deep down in, in the sea. Uh, by the way, deep down means 2,200 meters in this case. And so the, the, the current travels through the water to a beach electrode. And interestingly enough, the sea bridge, so to speak, was, it, it, it kind of was very similar to a Zena diode because once you are further away than I believe five kilometers or so, the voltage drop would always be 5.2 volt. Why? Yeah, because the only narrow spaces was the electrode on this side and the electrode on this side, these were more or less small, but then the ocean can be thought of as a conductor of infinite widths. So the water itself uh, doesn't produce much of resistance, but the resistance is concentrated around this electrode and this electrode. So that was COPS, and again, we did it with the lattice XP2-17. Uh, the next pro uh, project was uh, also something unique, a 250 amp uh, and 100 volt current source for a proton cyclotron bumper magnets at a a uh, specified precision of 10 ppm, which is quite a challenge. And, the, and, and, and especially since the 10 ppm uh, precision had to be maintained down to a static DC level. And this is something that uh, will be destroyed by the temperature coefficients of the involved uh, operational amplifier. So what we did is we put two copper layers on the printed circuit board, both um, 100 micrometer thick. And these copper layers would then be heated up to 52 degrees. So after two hours or so, the entire board would be heated to a stable temperature and this way, we also got the 10 ppm precision uh, at, at state, static DC levels. Um, and uh, what is a bumper magnet or what are bumper magnets? 
Well, if you have a proton cyclotron um, during during the running of the protons around in circles, uh, more and more protons uh, would catch up electrons and kind of disappear from the stream. And so every now and then the uh, the uh, how do you call this uh, the, the 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 plasma that runs around was diverted and sent through a chamber that would again I don't remember how but would that would again produce enough protons for the next let's say uh, period uh, of the cyclotron running and here you see then. Uh, very quickly, the, uh, the, the, the proton stream would be switched or diverted to this uh, proton enhancement chamber, and then the protons would be generated, and then you would slowly switch it back to the uh, cyclotron um, uh, for, for experiments. So that was a CCD one. And then the last uh, project that I did uh, before retirement was the um, Merlin Satellites Frequency Reference Unit. Uh, Merlin is a satellite that hopefully will be deployed in 2027 or so. And it is supposed to measure the uh, methane concentration in the atmosphere at a precision of 150 by 150 meter um, rectangles, so, do, so to speak. Uh, the way it is done is quite simple. Methane has a very, very specific absorption spectrum. Uh, you see this dip here. Um, and this absorption consists of six spectral lines that are kind of very close to each other. So they add, um, they add up to this response. And this is unique for methane. There is no other gas in the vicinity that has a similar uh, absorption spectrum. So what is being done is one laser pulse is sent, you see this yellow line here, is sent into this absorption region. And then the backscattering is picked up by the satellite uh, and its magnitude is recorded. And 200 microseconds later, another laser beam is directed towards the, uh, towards the Earth. That is 10 gigahertz away from the first pulse. And so in, in the backscatter there, you receive uh, the, the energy when there is no methane backscatter. And so from the difference of the backscatter signals of these two signals, you can easily determine the methane content. Um, the, the difficult part of this is to generate the needed laser frequencies that uh, and these are generated by uh, solid state 10 milliwatt laser diodes. And that is what the frequency reference unit and microcore in this case uh, did. It stabilized the laser frequencies to produce uh, the, 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 the laser diodes to produce these two frequencies. And the, these 10 milliwatt signals will then be used uh, by a high energy laser system that is pumped and where, where the uh, laser signals runs in circle until one of the mirrors uh, is switched off and the laser beam is released from running around. Um, 
microcore in this case was only used or is being used in this case uh, in the engineering and qualification model because unfortunately microcore is not a certified uh, uh, processor as far as the uh, uh, as satellites is concerned and therefore it was felt that it would be much easier to re-engineer the whole thing and do all the control in pure VHDL without processor and that this would be cheaper than certifying uh, microcore itself. In retrospect, it turns out that it may have been cheaper to certify microcore, but this is not how the project went, unfortunately. And uh, some more words about, well, how is the synchronization done? Uh, there is a so-called absolute frequency reference on board the satellite or on, as part of the frequency reference unit, which is a tube filled with methane. And then a laser beam is sent through this tube every now and then with uh, laser diodes with, with receiving photodiodes before the tube and after the tube. And so the absorption of the of the tube can be measured. And so in that respect, it is very easy to find exactly this region uh, on this frequency. And then there is a very simple wave meter also on board the satellite, which consists uh, in its very heart uh, of a 760 pixel uh, sensor line and uh, a so-called uh, FISO is used to, to scan the laser signal or on, through the, the scan line, depending on the frequency. And so we have the absolute frequency with a wave meter, we have a relative deviation, and so we can, is, is, we can precisely determine this point as well as this point. Okay, uh, so these were the major applications. Besides these, there were uh, quite a number of ad hoc projects that we did in order to build measurement instruments and whatnot that were needed to realize the projects uh, during the engineering phase. Okay. Um, ha. New developments in microcore. Um, I tried to realize uh, UDP TP on uh, microcore. Uh, I did not even try. I, I realized it actually without byte addressing, and it turns out that. This can be done quite well and is, very, is quite efficient, but unfortunately, all the existing large IP packages depend on byte addressing. And so with my approach, I couldn't use any of those. And so I came to the conclusion, bytes are actually needed sometimes. And so um, I took the time and and build uh, byte addressing into microcore. And now you have uh, all possibilities because byte addressing only makes sense if you have a 16-bit or a 32-bit or a 64-bit architecture um, because with under other word widths, the, the concept of bytes doesn't make sense because you, you cannot really address it uh, in, a, in a linear address range. And so you have now all, all words available. You can do uh, everything as before. Microcore is a cell address machine with arbitrary word widths. And if you have 16 or 32 bits, you have a choice whether you want to use cell addressing or byte addressing. And um, while I was doing this, it became clear to me that the uh, test of the division 
instructions that I had done uh, long ago had never been completely tested, but I had stochastic tests and the stochastic tests looked nice. But what if I did a comprehensive test? And it was possible to squeeze the software that is needed for an interactive test of dividing a number by divisor and then multiplying uh, the, the, the quotient with the divisor and adding the remainder. And then you should get your original dividend if everything is fine. That the code to do that uh, and also with an interactive uh, terminal present as a second task does fit into 1022 instructions. And that means 1022 instructions can be addressed by a 10-bit architecture. And so I did a 10-bit microcore running this program. And then it turns out that the time needed for a comprehensive test of division and multiplication, that means 20-bit dividend divided by 10-bit divisor takes only four hours. And so after four hours, all the number combinations have been tested. And as it turned out, the mass itself was correct, but the overflow bit had quite a number of errors. And sometimes uh, a wrong result would be computed because of overflows, but the overflow bit was not set. And that has changed now. And now microcore also has a proven precise division and multiplication. Okay, that's it for today. Great, thank you very much. So I think that was a very great overview uh, of the applications that you did with microcore and lots of things to discuss of, obviously and go into detail. Um, we will probably have some questions on that. So Peter, you, you raise your hand already. Peter Yakaki, I think. You have to unmute if you have a question. No. We don't hear you. Yeah, well, you're unmuted, but we don't hear you, Peter, unfortunately. Perhaps your microphone is muted. <laughs> this is the microphone. I, I have that many inputs and outputs I switched before. No, that's right. No, I, I didn't have a question, big, but uh, I, yeah, no, I just found it very interesting. I, 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 I said I was immersed in in it, so uh, that, and very deep. <laughs> but yes, no, that was that was really interesting stuff, and um, you know, but uh, micro cool uh, as well. Uh, you know, I, I'll, I'll look more into it as well. But yeah, thank you, mm -hmm. thank you, Charles. Yeah. So, other comments, Christian. Uh, I look at all this and I'd like to have an idea when it was implemented and why Fort was uh, selected to do it at the time. Ha, yeah, that has a prehistory. I mean, I'm programming in Fort since 1980. And I never felt the need to use any other uh, programming language. And, and I had, since I was self-employed, I had a choice and I always cooperate with, with scientists who were not interested in how I realized something as long as it worked. And so I used the RTX 2000 and then uh, Harris uh, stopped the RTX 2000. I had to use something else. I choose a Texas instrument DSP, which was quite new. I think it was the 320C28 or something just to find bugs in this DSP that even Texas instrument didn't know about yet. And that made me kind of furious. 
this was the time of the Spartan 2 technology, the XC4000 series, and I came to the conclusion that if I, I do my own processor, it would fit into an XC4000, which it actually did. Um, and so in 2001, I believe the development started for the XC4000. And since then I kept uh, improving uh, microcore. And since I used it early on in real projects, I mean, with, real, with the real projects, I got new experiences and <coughs> found new requirements. And that already, uh, of course, had ramifications on, on microcore itself. And in that respect, I believe I, I went through a very, very similar development as Chuck Moore went with Force itself, because he never started to, to build a programming language. And uh, well, I, I started to build a processor, of course. But, but in the course of time, he tried different concepts. And finally, it was Force. And the same happened to Microcore. Uh, it, it improved with every project. A second question. Uh, obviously, you're very good with microcomputer design and programming, but behind all this, there is a very, very deep understanding of whichever field of application you were working with. What's the the side of class that we don't see that allows you to see to do that? Now, yeah, I'm an inventive person and and usually in the past when I looked at micro uh, controller systems, um, for me it usually was easier to invent a new uh, peripheral driver instead of trying to understand how existing peripheral drivers worked. So that is one thing. And as far as the application domains are concerned, well, yeah, that is the interesting part. Uh, with every customer, uh, I learned new things and, and I learned a completely new field. Uh, and what was interesting in that respect in the cooperation with the uh, ocean bottom seismologists, uh, the geophysicists, um, they wanted to do certain things and then in their head they made up some ideas of how difficult this might be if this is turned into electronics and so with this filter in their head they already asked me not the naive questions but the preformed questions and sometimes after years it turned out that they just didn't dare to ask the right questions because they could have been done electronically quite easily but they didn't know that and this is something if you if you cooperate with scientists that you have to be very very aware of this this thought mechanism It answers my question. Thank you. Yeah, getting solutions is one thing, and we learn this as engineers, but thinking about the right problems, that is very hard. Mm -hmm. Are there any other questions, comments? Well, thank you very much. You know how to contact uh, uh, Klaus, and uh, so if you want to, uh put your hands on microcore then uh yeah get in contact and see what can be done thank you for your attention right. sure thank you klaus that's very super mm -hmm. danke schön yeah another another participant um who is in the meeting is um I wrote in the chat, sorry for Brad, because Brad Nelson could, uh, Brad, uh, sorry, Brad Rodriguez could not uh, make it today, but he will uh, present in December. So the next participant I have here on the schedule is Willem Overkirk with okay. uh, Raspberry Pi PO Assembler. 
This is very interesting for Peter Jacaki and everyone who works with the Raspberry Pi. Are you ready, uh, William? Yes, I think so. Go ahead, please. Okay, then I start to share my screen. Can you see it? Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. I'll try to move something out of the way. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, I have a bit of a starter. I'm currently working on a, on a robot that is a bird-like robot. <laughs> it's not going to fly, but it's going to jump. It jumps high in the air and tries to uh, um, uh, 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 tries to take the attention of people by um, speaking to them. And it also uh, it makes uh, certain movements to, um, yeah, I don't know the, the correct word, but it, it tries to, uh, to charm them. That's like the correct word. It's, uh, it's searching for a partner. That's, uh, that's really the, the correct one. <laughs> so it's mating. That's the correct mating. one. <laughs> mating, yeah. So uh, no, this, this is just a start. It's a, a frame with some servos and uh, some 3D printed parts and a mask in metal. Still a lot of work, but uh, I'm really uh, looking forward to this thing. Then we have the, the autumn is just uh, started. And I did make a, a, a picture of my, uh, of, of a leaf of my fig tree with the RP2040 on it. You see the, the leaf is quite big. Mm -hmm. And a nice color, a really autumn. Um, then I come to the uh, Raspberry Pi uh, PO. The PO is a programmable input output unit. It contains uh, four state machines, you can see here. Oh, it's, Willem, can yes. you make your screen larger so we can... Yes, of course. <clears throat> Does this help? Yes, yes, or more, if you can full screen. Uh, okay, I try to use full screen. Where can I select that? Well, I can read it, no problem. I don't know if, if uh, the other people uh, can follow. It's okay. Yeah, it's much better now. Okay. It's quite small on your screens. Uh, so so you, see, you can see the contents of the PO for state machines that are really a simple uh, processing units. Yeah. Each uh, state machine has uh, two FIFOs, one for the input and one for the output. And it's also connected to the I.O. And which I.O. you can program. Then there is an instruction memory for 32 instructions. And all four state machines can use programs that, uh, that are stored there. And it can be the same program, but it can also be different programs. So that's a fine, uh, very nice feature of it. It also has interrupt capability. Uh, there, are only, there are only eight opcodes. It's very small uh, number of that. But because um, the function of each program can be programmed using the general control registers, it's still very flexible. For example, when you do um, using a shift instruction, you can uh, program it to do as, uh, one to 32 bits, you can uh, set the direction and, and, and you can also, of course, set the destination. The destination can be a uh, register, but it can also be an IO pin. So each state machine also has uh, six dedicated registers, one for the clock frequency, that's uh, that, that means the, the, the clock that state machine is running on, 
Also, I, I also already mentioned the shift register control. Also, there are pin controls. Each, uh, each opcode can address more than one pin. That's also a very special feature. I think at maximum there are five pins to control by each opcode. And how we will see later. And then there's, there's another special feature, and that is you can, uh, there's a register where you can store a number, and that number will be executed as an opcode. And it's executed before memory. So it, when you store something there, it's immediately executed. And uh, by that way, you can uh, control programs, you can send them in a different direction or use a different part. Now we get the state machine structure here. It has two scratch registers, X and Y. Uh, we already mentioned the input uh, and output shift register. There's program counter, a clock divisor, uh, we all already mentioned. And there's some control logic to make it function. And you can see it's connected to the general purpose IO for input and output. Then we get to the next part, the, which will be highlighted. The OSR, this is the output shift register. You can see it uh, can be connected to itself. You can be connected to the FIFO for input or output data. In the, in the case of the OSR, it's input data. And uh, already also to, uh, to the in and output pins. Each queue has uh, four positions, but uh, you can uh, program it that it steals uh, the FIFO from, uh, for example, uh, the Input unit can steal the registers from the output unit, and then it has eight registers. But of course, the output unit does not have any uh, FIFO anymore. So you can uh, select and use the hardware very flexible. It's simple, uh, but, but quite difficult to, uh, to, pro to program uh, at first, because they don't describe any all the details in the data sheet. And I think that is because most people use uh, C or Python nowadays, and that there the assembler is already included. So we don't have to build it ourselves. Uh, it can be coupled to the input shift register, and it can, uh, uh, one very nice feature, I don't know how to use it for now, but it can execute the data that comes into it as an opcode. I think there are very nice, uh, that is a very nice feature. Now, I, the PO assembler I did build, uh, I built standard version using, uh, based on the ANSI standard and a maker version to test it. And the maker version mm, did give me a lot of problems because Maker is deliberately not ANSI standard. And that's a problem for me because we have to change uh, a lot of things. I, now, I like to list uh, some of the things that I came up to. Uh, there's no value there, but the solution is very simple, of course. Use variable and fetch and store. That also works very nice, but variable is, variable is not non-standard. And that means uh, we have to give an init value to it. Now, and it's also uh, quite easy to change this. We pro provide an init value. But uh, you have to, uh, the problem with this is that you have to run through all your code and, uh, and, and make uh, a, lot, a lot of small adjustments. Create does not work on run. Uh, but that's already uh, covered by the standard. There's a solution for that using buffer column. That creating always a buffer in RAM. Then there are no blank, no invert, no dot R, no award, no award quote, and no vocabularies. 
and the vocabularies and a board quote, or especially a board, I found a little bit dis disturbing because you cannot uh, um, divide your program into background and foreground words. I really do like vocabulary uh, uh, to, to build uh, words that are only needed for the construction. And now in, 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 uh, everything comes in the same vocabulary. But there are solutions. You can uh, add a system built. I don't know uh, by who, but I, th I think Uli knows it. There's an add-on for uh, Matrix to add vocabularies, Uli, but... Yeah, yeah, so this is all based on Manfred Marlow's work. That was and, it, uh, yep. the challenge. The challenge is always that um, um uh, makers compiles directly into flash and so you have to uh, know the right data at the first, uh, uh, initially already so so you can't yeah. backpatch uh, in, in in any way and uh, manfred figured out a good way to to make uh, vocabularies uh, uh, with a different than the traditional implementation. And so, yeah, it's, it's, it's somewhere it's possible and it's used in this VOC system that Manfred prefers um, uh, and uh, uh, you have to configure it. So it's, it, yes. vocabularies are not ready out of the box, but it, they are somewhere and uh, you have to collect uh, yeah. uh, the, this. Yeah, so the, so that's that are the that's one of the problems when you uh, use this system. So you have to find alternatives or build these yourself. And sometimes that includes a lot of work, a lot of extra work. So I'm quite a favorite of the standard. Um, then there is a exceptionally slow compilation when we use postpone, and, and the solution I use is. Uh, um, uh, do, do not use postpone and build uh, all separate definitions to cover that. And then we have an other thing that you that that uh, takes you when you you build you're making an error in an in a file. Uh, when there is an error, a quit is executed, and the the solution the what what happens is that system goes to decimal. I mostly work in hex, so. It's quite disturbing when you're compiling a file and you get a small error, and then it you get a lot of errors because the system the, the number system is changed. There's no solution for that uh, other than redefining uh, makers. And then there's the the last problem I uh, encountered was um, when you get uh, some. A lot of error messages that sometimes you get in an endless loop, especially with error message three. And Uli provided the solution for it by uh, um, changing the, the contents of interrupt factor three with some code. And all these things make it a little bit nicer to work with, but when you see all the problems you have to work through, it should be nice, but then we that when we uh, we are all using some kind of the same standard. It, it makes uh, working a lot easier. And I, I do not mean that we, every, every system does have to cover the complete standard, but it should be nice. It, 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 you, you can change anything afterwards. If you don't like a standard, you add your own uh, words. And that, that's one of the nice things I like about Ford. You, build your own uh, development environment. But when you when we are sharing more or less the same standard, it's uh, a little bit more easy to do that. So enough about the problems. Uh, I'd like to show you one of the opcodes. This is the set opcode. The set opcode can be used to uh, um, give some data to register, but also uh, to set uh, a port uh, high or low. And I like to go through it. At the left, we have five bits, sorry, at the right, we have five, the five uh, blue bits are used for data, 30, uh, 0 to 31, but it can also be 
individual I.O. bits. So then you have five I.O. bits you can address. Then we have a destination um, that gives um, uh, uh, the, uh, the possibility to uh, address uh, the X or Y register, an I.O. pin, uh, pin direction, etc. And then we have the, the really special field of it, the delay side set field. Uh, the default uh, action is uh, for delay. You can set there a number from zero to 31. If there are zero, the instruction is executed in one cycle. And if there, if you set uh, 31 to it, the instruction is executed in 31 plus one cycle, so 32 cycles. And with that, it's quite easy to uh, get uh, a correct bit timing for input and output uh, units. And now the other part of it, the side set. Uh, the side set, you can um, set a flag in the register. And when you do that, you can use part of this field from zero to five bits. Uh, as an extra I.O. bit. So you can uh, use uh, uh, together with uh, the data field and the side set field, can, uh, can, you can address extra I.O. bits. But uh, there's a, a drawback, you can not use as many delay bits then. When you use one bit uh, for side set, you can only use four delay bits. And there's another uh, option. You can also uh, the you can um, the, the side set you can use in two ways. One is uh, sorry, is there a question? No. I think this was just an open mic, and I just closed it. Okay. Uh, this um, you can use it in two ways. It, um, when you um, set. Uh, the bit that side set is used, you, can, you have to use it on every instruction, but, but you can also do the optional side set, uh, as they call it. And then uh, the highest bit of this field, bit, uh, bit 12, is used as a marker. And when this marker is set, the bits below it, and how many you have to give, uh, you have to set in one of the register, is used as an optional I.O. bit. So uh, when you use the optional version, you need always one extra. You you need one extra bit to market it uh, to market it. But there's um, the, the main function uh, of that is that when uh, in when you browse to the data sheet, you see that um, the side set bits uh, are always prefer preferred before the data. Uh, bits so when uh, site set is set uh, the data bits do nothing anymore <laughs> and antivirus has uh, gone wild uh, but um, so when you use when you want to use uh, both options in uh, in the opcode uh, sometimes uh, setting a bit using the data field and sometimes setting the bit using the side set bit, you have to use the optional version. That's the only way to uh, to do to address uh, an I/O bit in two ways. That was uh, uh, the the most different difficult one to find in the data sheet. How to do that? Then we have uh, some small programs. This is. Uh, Calling my my first PO program and uh, what does it do? It uh, selects a, a P, a state machine one and PO one. Uh, sorry, state machine zero and PO zero uh, for action. It cleans the code space mirror and the code space mirror I use uh, because you can't decompile. Um, PO opcodes. PO opcodes are write only, so I uh, use a mirror to control my program and check it. Then we set the, the clock frequency the RP2040 is running on. You have to uh, find it out uh, for yourself uh, which, uh, at which frequency it's running. 
on because uh, setting the frequency for uh, a PO uh, needs a reference. And this uh, sys clock is used as a reference. Then there's the next uh, instruction. And it uh, sets a pin 25 as an output pin. And uh, it also uh, uh, gives a direction that uh, not only pin 25, but also the next pin is used as an, uh, as an output. So pin 25, two means pin 25 and 26. And if you set pin 25, three, then uh, you are addressing three bits. That is also used here. Here is the set instruction. And the set, set instruction is used to uh, set the IO direction. And when it's one, it's an output. And so uh, three sets uh, both pin 25 and pin 26 as an output. Then we have an, 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 an endless weight loop that uh, just jumps to itself. And why that is, we, we, I'll show you a little uh, further on. Then there's another nice feature. Uh, you, um, you can make loops on the, in the PO without using uh, time and, and code space. You can, uh, there's one of the registers contains a field where the begin of the loop can be noted and the end of the loop. And that's called wrap function. So I keep that, uh, did keep the, the, those names. So this is an, an endless loop that goes, uh, that, that do, doesn't consume any uh, time. And then we have the, the program. The first part is setting some delay cycles. That is, the, this is using the delay field. And then it's setting some bits, some output bits. Again, uh, some delay, and uh, all, uh, also setting the Y register to 31. So you can see that uh, um, by using that, this extra field, you can add more than one function to an opcode. That's uh, why programs for the PO can be very short. The, the last thing is just delay loop. It's uh, it, set output pins low and it uh, uh, goes 31 times to, to this loop. So you can see an output uh, getting high and low. And finally, we uh, use uh, the, the function where we, uh, that you can execute an opcode directly. Opcode zero means uh, jump to address zero on State machine zero. This, uh, uh, this command uh, say, says to the state machine, start uh, executing at, the, at address zero. And then we have a complete PO program and it's uh, decompiled li like this. You see only a few opcodes. The delay you can see between the square brackets. And uh, the, the jump addresses are also decompiled so you can see how it jumps. Um, this program is a little flasher. It just uh, sets the LED on the RP2040 port on and off. When you jump to address two, it, uh, it, it goes to the main loop. This, uh, this is uh, jump to, uh, to address two on state machine zero. So then go, the LED goes flashing. When you want to do set the LED on, you jump to the wait loop. That is on address one. You can see it here. This ju just jumps to itself. So you jump to the to the wait loop and then execute the instruction set uh, pin 25 and pin 20, 26 off. And then the LED is off and stays off. The LED on is the a bit more of the same, except that you set uh, pin 25 and pin 26 on. And then we have a, a first program controlled by Ford. Uh, the next one is a little more useful. It's a, it's a MUART and uh, the power rate, um, uh, the calculation of the power rate is quite uh, simple. Just 
eight times uh, the, the 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 powder rate you give on that's the frequency of the of the for the reward. I don't go uh, through it all, but uh, only to some things. You, uh, we use the side set option here. So pin 26 is used uh, in the side field. And pin 26 is also used as an output pin. And pin 26 is also used for the set uh, instruction. So we, uh, pin 26 can be controlled by the side field by the out opcode and by the set opcode. And uh, you, we, we can see uh, why the, this, uh, the optional side set is useful because um, we set, uh, if I just do it correct, yes. Uh, we output a data on this line. And when we, uh, we didn't, say it was optional, the contents of the site set field are, are used. And, and in the site set field, there's no data now. So it's zero. Uh, this, uh, when we didn't use the optional function, there is no data output. Now, finally, uh, we uh, do eight bits. And uh, the number of bits is set here on this line and it's set to seven. And that is because um, the until doesn't stop on zero, but on passing zero. And that's one of the obscure features of the, of the PO. Now, uh, this is um, just the, the, the Muhart and it gets data from the FIFO. And here we control if there's space on the FIFO. If, if there's space on the FIFO, we output uh, data to it. And then it comes out very nicely. And I like to show one extra thing. And this is when you can reuse programs. This is the same program again, as we did here before. But we define a second uh, program for uh, state machine one on the same PO that does a copy of the main registers of the of the PO zero. So th this command uh, says copy from PO zero to myself that uh, all data. So it gets the the program begin and end and uh, the, the the frequency. But uh, we do some extra thing. We use the bout command again, and we set it to another bout rate, and we give new pins to it. And finally, we say also start state machine uh, one at, at zero also. And now we have a second MUART that runs in uh, completely parallel to the other and use the same code as the other one. So you can define as many muarts as you like or any other IO. And I, I calculate, for example, when you use uh, the, the, the smart LEDs that you can buy nowadays, they build sometimes screens with it, large screens. And when you use it for uh, a, 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 a screen driver, you can, uh, using all state machines, you can address 8,000 LEDs with it at 30 hertz, about 30 hertz. So it's it's usable as a screen. Then you have a, 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 a very small controller with a very powerful uh, uh, output. You can you can then uh, use I think about 32 by 32 LEDs on one controller, and then you can use uh, those large large uh, screens that are used uh, along uh, sport events and. That. And then we can build them ourselves or any other thing. Um, I'd like to show a little bit of the manual I wrote. Uh, 
Uh, yes, there it is. And there, there are a lot of directors, directors to control it. And that's uh, because you have to use those uh, registers to instruct the PO. And uh, some of them we already did see. Um, the, the set pin is also an optional pin. You can also set the, the output strength of a pin, that's how the, the, the current it, you can uh, uh, take from it. And you can set pins as inputs. And there's, I added a little table uh, so you can uh, see how, uh, which type of input you can select, float, pull up, pull down. The output strength of an uh, output driver, 2, 4, and 8, and 12 milliamps. And then we have the wrap target, the steel function. Um, one of the also nice features is when you write a program that collects uh, uh, serial data, for example, you can um, instruct the program that after uh, it uh, receives a certain amount of bits, it pushes them automatically on the FIFO. So you have, uh, you don't have to use uh, a push instruction uh, separately to push it on the FIFO, but it does that in, after it uh, receives a certain uh, amount of, uh, of bits. And that can be from one to 32 bits. So you can use that very uh, flexible. And the same goes for the input and you, output some bits and you can say after a certain amount of bits we need new data so i will um, put it in uh, for you in in the, the the chat if you like it you like to uh, uh, read it there are also some examples the muart example is uh, with with some uh, real data collected from it. Then we have a um, few other things. A rotary encoder I did a test. Um, here is the LED controller. I already um, uh, uh, made a um, more complex one um, that can uh, address from zero to uh, a thousand of, uh, of LEDs. It's also uh, nice. You can it, uh, although it's uh, it's quite limited, but when you combine it with uh, some fourth code, you can do quite powerful things with it. Now I think that's it, that uh, this is it for me. You, you you see the bit pattern for the for the LED there, twenty four bits, and finally an SPE input and output. But I think that's the, this is enough for now. It should, it should be a short presentation. Any <laughs> questions? Wow. Yeah, amazing bandwidth of things and applications that you did. So uh, I, yeah, I, I, I knew you were working on it, but uh, I didn't realize that you made the, these many applications. Great. Thank yes, you you, amazing, I, amazing I like to video. test this uh, when I, I, I don't like to give uh, um, uh, friends programs that um, that are not tested. Sure. So I need to write some programs. <laughs> I see. So you're not yeah. saying these are just finger finger exercises. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, great. Christian. Yeah, th this is also a nice one. This, uh, the, uh, 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 state machines can communicate, but it's only uh, you can only com communicate using the IRQ option of it. Mm -hmm. You have to, uh, there are two instruction, a weight instruction and an IRQ, and both can be used to um, to syn synchronize programs on different state machines. And I made uh, the last example is uh, uses that. Mm -hmm. Great. Okay. Mm -hmm. Christian. Uh, yeah, Christian. Christian. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, watching this presentation, I understood basically that this is 
a main processor running for yes capable of controlling eight tiny processors controlling their own bits yeah uh, these tiny processors are only programmable in assembler is uh, right? yes it, it it has its own own uh, opcode set eight opcodes now this appears to be a totally independent peripheral those yep. IOs. If the the fourth uh, program uh, processor hangs for some reason, do the small PIOs keep on running? Like if I program a timer, a hardware timer, it yes. keeps on working even if the main code is hung up. Yep. Does that do the same thing? You can do the same thing. I, I made some example programs that uh, work completely independent. And there are also other options. You can um, use the direct memory access to uh, 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 put data to it. For example, uh, the uh, building screens with it, like I just said before, with the uh, with the smart uh, with smart LED, you can add in some piece of memory a complete uh, a picture you want to have on the on the screen and you only have to uh, select that both the PO and the direct memory access are, are coupled with each other and then you are only you only have to update the, the screen when you would want to have another picture okay and with your presentation it made me it made me understand why peter jacaki had interest in the rp2040 it's very similar to the the propeller okay it's the only uh, other mcu i saw that has eight independent processors yes <laughs> yes yeah. it's uh, it's uh, it's uh, when you look at it there are 10 processors in it Mm -hmm. yeah, seven, uh, yeah. one main and eight yeah. smalls. So yeah. actually, I think it's more like the smart pins that the propeller two has, because uh, uh, while we, we we're talking about pros processors, but it, it, it's more the state machines. They have really only sixteen possible instruction, and the program yeah. memory is very very limited. Very limited. Yes. Yeah. So so it's 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 really for doing special purpose I/O. I think uh, and and not general programs. No, no, no. You, 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 uh, they have examples for general programming, for example, an addition. Mm -hmm. But I, I, I believe that an addition takes about a minute. Well, so okay. it's not really yeah. useful for that. Yeah, uh, but can you control the reset pin of the CPU? I, I mean, Christian asked, uh, what if the main CPU hangs? Can we program something like a watchdog timer with it? I think so, yes. You can, I think you can do that. No, yeah. not directly, yeah. but you have to couple it, uh, couple one pin to the out, oh, yeah, uh, yeah. Ex external to the CPU, yeah. one one I/O pin to the. There's no direct link from the from a PO to uh, to the reset to the reset pin. Mm -hmm. But yeah, if you do that outside, yeah, then that would be fine. So you you trigger the state machine uh, from the program, and if you don't do that, then it will reset the program. Yes, but I think yeah. there's already. Um, <laughs> a watchdog in it <laughs> yeah yeah maybe you want to have another one yes <laughs> I don't oh I, I like to have five yeah 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 mm -hmm. thanks a lot for this presentation okay what, mm -hmm. what i learned here will probably allow me to venture into exploration of pios on the rp2040 thanks mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It. 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 Uh, the. The POs made me. Uh, inter. Gave me then some uh, interest in the in the CPU too. Yeah. I. I don't like the instruction set of the CPU itself. Uh, I think Arm made a mess of it. Uh, but um, it's and all. All in all, it's a nice CPU. Yeah. Right. So, are there any other questions to Willem? Yeah, I, I've got one. Go ahead. Um, <clears throat> just to deconfuse myself a little bit. Uh, when you talk about these opcodes, 
and you talk about uh, the state machine that has different states. Are those opcodes and the states, are they the same or are, or are they different things? I, uh, I, it, 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 it's a bit difficult. They call it a state machine, but it, it, it is in fact a, a simple CPU. So, okay, thanks. Yeah, then, then yeah. I get it, yeah. Mm -hmm. And it's all dedicated to controlling hardware. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. And the, 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 the motivation that they give is that uh, they provide some standard uh, I, uh, and, uh, protocols to, uh, to, the, to the CPU. But uh, when you have some very, well, you want to do some very specific things, you can program the, uh, them yourself. And I think that's really, really useful. But it's still quite difficult to uh, find unique programs for you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah, I could think of maybe non standard with serial line, like yes. ten, yeah, that you transmit 10 bits or something like this, which normal hardware doesn't support. Yep. And depending on your application, I mean, I, I had an application with four megabit uh, serial line and um, uh, there, there it was quite uh, reasonable. Well, well, this was done with FPGAs on, and there you, there you can do the same thing, uh, not transmitting eight bits, but 10 bits. Um, yes, uh, and that, yeah, that, 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 that are some, uh, this mm -hmm. could be useful, yes. Yeah. Okay, right. any other things? That's and we are ready. Should I, pro should I pro provide the, um, the documentation? Sure. Absolutely. Are you interested? Oh, yes, yeah, sure. Okay. Yeah. Uh, just, uh, just, one, just one thing, just uh, to get it perfectly clear in my head now. Uh, can, you give, uh, can you give this state machine, this, this PO uh, processor, can you give it the start of an address? Uh, and uh, a length and have it go through all the bytes uh, from that address and through to the length and then uh, do something with each byte uh, before it, it either it transmits it or does whatever it should do with it. Can it do that? You, you, you can give a start point, you can, give, you can uh... Uh, but you can also get, uh, as I've shown in one of the examples, you can have multiple start points in each program. Also, a program can consist of, uh, of several parts. Um, I made an example for uh, a flash memory chip. And there I built an, an output function and an input function. And uh, those two programs work together as, as one, but sometimes you only need output and sometimes you need output and input. And I made but, a construction for that. Can, that but it, it can do DMA, it can work with or, or, or do... Uh, no, you, uh, the, the PO has shared uh, uh, program memory. This, uh, the, the functions can be uh, addressed by any other uh, function in the, in, the, in the controller. So you can give the address of the, the FIFO, for example, to the DMA, to the DMA function. And then it gets data from that DMA. It's just that simple. Excellent. Thanks. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. That's it. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you, Willem, once again. Okay. And um, yeah, we uh, proceed to our next speaker, which is uh, Brett Nelson. And we learn again, exciting news about ESP32 and uh, uh, last time about, yeah, the, the assembler was on the horizon and the disassembler. And uh, now we hear lots of improvement, hopefully. Brad, I'm very curious of what you can tell us. So Indeed, um, let me share my screen. I, I think, I think, uh, Willem, uh, if you could stop sharing, it's preventing me from. Uh, yeah, I, I hope to unshare um, the green one on the bottom. Yes, I the, but that disappeared. Oh, so I steal it from you. Okay. Mm -hmm. <laughs>
Yes, it's uh, now it's here again. <laughs> <laughs> and now, now I'm stopping, and then we are all fine. All right, is that uh, visible? Yes. All right. Um, so let me uh, let me talk about uh, the things that have changed with ESP uh, thirty two fourth in the last uh, month or so. Um, one thing I wanted to call out is that uh, there was a bug in uh, the uh, case statement that I added uh, uh, last time around and talked about, and uh, and Peterman uh, uh, spotted this and uh, noted that I I had actually in the in the default case there was uh, sort of incorrect handling so that you would end up with uh, the top of the stack uh, getting smashed. So I've changed around the order of things, and and uh, it should now be uh, behaving correctly. Um, I also wanted to thank, and I've forgotten who it was that suggested this, but uh, someone uh, in, in this forum uh, suggested the idea of uh, calling out to the Arduino tools at the command line uh, to make it more convenient to both build and to flash. And I've added that to the uh, to the separate make files that, that drive the, 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 the construction of the system. And that makes it uh, a good deal easier for me to, to go and try the the setup of things uh and, and and i i can just even flash from the command line which is is a whole lot handier than firing up the ide each time so thanks to whoever that was so uh anyways um i as as was mentioned i've, I've been working on an assembler disassembler and and uh uh have have some progress to report in that front it's it's come a ways um, but but why an assembler? Um, I've got a bunch of things that I'd like to do with one. Maybe uh, do some hand handwritten uh, uh, machine learning kernels. Um, but uh, you know, it's also just the principle that that no fourth is, is complete without one, and, and ESP thirty two fourth has gotten a goodly ways without one actually. Um, uh, and it, maybe maybe I work towards uh, ditching the C compiler. But um, the other thing I I want. Uh, out of this is, is to get, actually get a disassembler and in some ways this is actually almost more of my primary motive i i, I like to poke around inside uh the system and take a look at uh the code that was generated and uh, understand more about the quality of it um and look around at some of the code that's in the in the system uh sort of in an interactive uh fourthy sort of way so that that power to reach out and touch the machine um so um ESP32 fourth actually supports a, a number of uh, variations on the ESP32. There's um, both the Tencelica uh, Extensa instruction set, um, and now with the ESP32 C3, there's there's also a RISC-V5. Um, so uh, they're they're each kind of uh, interesting and separate machines. Uh, the the Extensa L, L, LX6, which is in the sort of original ESP32. Uh, is, a, is a software IP core with, with a whole bunch of options that, that are picked, but it, the, the set of options in Extensa um, include support for two and three byte instructions. Um, it uh, actually has a, uh, a CPU mode uh, for, for supporting uh, an internal register window. So you have uh, sort of 16 registers that are visible, but as you enter a call frame, you can sort of slide uh, uh, back and forth in this in this uh, window there's actually 64 actual registers underneath and if you hit the edge of things there's a there's an exception handler that that fires and uh, uh, sort of map pulls uh, registers in and out to, to make it act like an infinite register window um, and then there's a set of floating point registers um, risk v5 which I've, I've just started looking at in, in the assembler and disassembler is, is is very hot off the presses here and and, and in, a, in a very early and uh, work in progress type state uh, this one is is an open source core and uh, the the version that's in the ESP 32 c3 supports two and four byte instructions um, and it's it's sort of more of a conventional risk CPU that uh, uses uh, jump and link style risk um, uh, X0 is is the sort of not really a real register, but is, is used for some of the encodings and, and also as a zero value. And then there is floating point support uh, as well. Um, so thinking about how to do an assembler, um, I, I wanted to build something that I could uh, sort of have uh, a, a simple core to it and, uh, and share between an assembler and a disassembler. And so this is a, this is a, 
an example of an instruction for the extends uh, uh, data sheet and it actually in some ways inspired kind of the path that I took which is that it lays out uh, each each instruction and sort of lists out the bit encodings and then for a given um, position it there's there's the bits the four bits that indicate uh, for 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 the uh, for R, R S N T you know in, in the various operands uh, which register to use and it occurs to me that well this description of this instruction both describes how to assemble but also to disassemble that instruction and um, this instruction set as I mentioned ha also has a, a, a two byte encoding and so there's actually you would almost never use this ad you would probably want to use this ad there's other kinds of operations uh, uh, shifts that have uh, a shift instruction for example here that has uh, the number of bits to shift by and notice here the number of uh, bits to shift by is uh, is not contiguous. So you'll have uh, some number of the, the bottom four bits are, are over on the right and, and uh, one bit is on the left. Um, and then there's things like a jump instruction where there's an offset built into the instruction. So these are the kinds of pieces we have to work with. And um, the uh, as I mentioned, there's a there's this calling convention um, and uh, there is support for a sort of a, a, a vanilla calling convention on the CPU where uh, where it is more like a uh, uh, branch and link, but uh, uh, so that's the call zero option, but there's also, uh, and there's a version of it that takes a register uh, as an operand. Um, and, uh, but, but in the windowed mode, which is what is used by a lot of the code that comes out of the C compiler, uh, there's this option to shift the window over by a multiple of four, and so uh, a typical situation you would uh, you would have a transition like this where some of the registers get pushed out out of the, the view, um, and then there's a uh, a set of call instructions call four, eight, and and twelve that do uh, a slide of that window, um, and then at the target you're expected to actually have this other entry instruction that specifies. Uh, how much uh, how much additional stack space to reserve? Um, so how do we approach an assembler? Well, uh, a shame that Brad Rodriguez is not here because uh, his his uh, he actually has a an excellent tutorial on the topic and uh, sort of goes down a, a very sensible and common path for fourth assemblers. The idea is that you you know have a set of words for maybe uh, instructions with no operand and you just uh, compile them into the uh, into the into the uh, the heap, uh, and then you can use uh, create does to uh, to make uh, different types of uh, uh, opcode encodings for uh, words that maybe have an immediate uh, parameter, um, and uh, and then you know build up uh, build up each of the instructions sort of one by one, and and if you do this carefully. Uh, it can actually be very dense. You can uh, specify it in a very small number of lines of code. And this is uh, the the approach that uh, uh, Bill Ragsdale took way back with the with 6502 assembler that uh, that was in fourth dimensions that uh, you know fits into into just six um, 96 lines or six uh, screens full. Um, and you know a typical pattern is that you'll use structured control flow in these. Um, and, and, and literally here it is, you know, just to give you give you an idea like these are uh, it is possible to do a, a, a very, you know, a, 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 an assembler in a very small number of lines of code. Um, but what about disassembly? A lot of the disassemblers I've seen kind of uh, take the, the approach of a, a, a of sort of uh, a, a lookup table and they uh, decode uh, instructions a little bit like how the CPU works or they use a big case statement. Um, and then they have to have special logic to emit the operands and then the opcodes. Um, and so uh, a thing that I, I got to thinking is, well, aren't these two kind of the same problem, right? They, in both cases, you need to, to list out all of the opcodes and you need to describe the meaning of the different operands and addressing modes. And it's just the difference between one being a forward transformation and the other being reverse. Um, so maybe we could describe both at the same time and, and maybe we could even come up with a, a vocabulary to make it general purpose. So, so what do we need to do this? We need a, a few kinds of, of, of operand bits to, to uh, describe uh, things that are like registers, things that are like numbers. Um, we might need to just describe addressing modes. Um, and then we just need to describe each opcode. So, you know, going back to this, this, um, 
data sheet for inspiration. Well, if I'm describing this instruction, um, you know, I, I could just sort of describe the bits in the instruction. Um, now, uh, this is this is a little inconvenient because this is going to push words into the stack, and I, I would need to figure out what R and S and T will do. Um, to make things simpler, I'm, I'm going to use uh, I'm going to actually treat uh, ones and zeros. I'm going to use the letter L and, and O, which have a resemblance to a one and a zero, and use them um, use them to indicate the bits. And so now I've got the flexibility to make each of these things uh, a word. And if I think about what I need for assembly and disassembly, well, I really need uh, sort of two uh, two things. I need uh, I need to know uh, figure out uh, the bits that are that make this particular instruction uh, this instruction. And so uh, those can be described uh, with a particular pattern. There's some ones and zeros here. And then uh, there's a mask that, that labels, you know, which of the bits um, actually have to have those values. And if I and the mask with an uh, piece of memory uh, and then look and see if it matches uh, the pattern, that will tell me if this, this is in fact that kind of instruction. Um, and if I want to generate the instruction, I can just use, you know, set the bits in that pattern. And then for each operand, um, there's also a mask, but uh, but instead there's going to be some complicated specific relationship between, or well, maybe a simple relationship between uh, each of the the operands and uh, and the bits that are in the mask. And so in this instruction, you know, the the bits that define which uh, register you're selecting for R, S, and T. Uh, Lie, lie in in each of these positions, and so these masks can be sort of accumulated in a table and described. And so the idea is just have a, a definition for uh, each of these words that uh, updates a mask, uh, updates the pattern, uh, or keeps track of um, keeps track of the uh, the mask uh, for each of the different types of operand. And so um, what uh, and so that would allow me to, to do something, you know, basically like this. Now, if I want to make it even more compact, I can use the same approach that uh, that a conventional fourth assembler uses, which is I want to be able to define words that uh, that uh, reuse these, uh, uh, you know, these pieces, so that I'm not specifying each bit pattern, each uh, each op code one by one, but can reuse them over and over. To do that, I'll want to pass some values in the stack because each of these words now doesn't do anything on the stack. So I had one more word, I had this word bits that takes in a value and then takes in a number of bits and it does the equivalent of the, the O's and the L's, the ones and the zeros uh, at that position. And so if I had some uh, pattern where maybe there's uh, a bunch of zeros followed by four particular bits, I could take in those bits from the stack uh, and then have everything else be the same within this particular pattern. And so uh, that would let me define opcodes. Oops, and this is a typo here. I just noticed this should say pattern instead of op. Um, and so uh, the uh, uh, I could use that pattern uh, to describe instructions of that family. Um, and then operands, well, how do they work? Well, I have to define three things, how to go from uh, a stack, uh, a value that's sitting on the stack to the to the bit pattern that will get put into those positions, and then how to print that if I'm doing disassembly. And then, uh, and then I need that mask. And so um, uh, I'm gonna actually skip over some of the, the details of the implementation. I'll go a little fast here, but uh, you know, we will, in the interest of time for folks, but uh, let's let's build up the pieces sort of quickly. Um, I have a, a word names that lets me just um, just list out all the registers uh, in succession. And then, um, for example, if I want to describe uh, a register, I can uh, have a word reg dot that prints uh, that word. And then for registers on the um, uh, on the extensa, because their their encoding uh, is just their numerical value, um, I can just use a no-op to describe it. So I can have two uh, two uh, execution tokens for the transformation from a stack value that describes an operand to the bit pattern for it, um, and then the, this reg dot 
word that prints the uh, the register. And in that way, I can now have a uh, uh, this word register that that puts on the stack a uh, these two execution tokens. And then I've got a defining word operand that uh, defines a uh, a bit position for that kind of thing. So I am then able to say a register operand R or a register operand S. Um, and that gives me a single bit. I can then, um, I can then uh, make a shortcut to, to do multiple bits. I see there's some chatter on the chat. If there are questions, please feel free to interrupt me. I will, um, if, if there are questions. Um, and so, this this kind of a, a style will allow me to define a word like add, um, and then I can go and describe each of the instructions in the instruction set, um, describing their operands, describing their bit values, and then assigning them a name. Um, and then if I have a pattern for how I want to, uh, uh, you know, for, for a, a family of instructions, for example, I noticed that, that all of the ALU instructions have uh, four bits at the beginning of them that describe which ALU instruction and then this general structure to them. I can then compactly uh, list them all out here in a small table, uh, listing that that parameter that goes into those four bits. Um, for uh, jumps, the decoding of the, the uh, operand is, uh, is a little different. Here I have to actually do a transformation to go from an address uh, on the stack to uh, an address that would fit in the bit pattern. I, I will take the, uh, the code address uh, that I'm at, uh, minus four, and this is just to transform the, um, transform a, a target address to, uh, to a relative address. Um, and then to print, I need to sign extend uh, to 18 bits, and then also add back in that offset to go back from a relative address to a uh, to an, uh, an absolute address. And then I can take those two definitions and define uh, this o OFS uh, type of operand. And then an offset can then be 18 of those in succession because the extensa uses an 18 bit uh, uses an 18 bit um, uh, jump jump address. And so I can then define a jump uh, just as an offset followed by a particular bit pattern. Um, and branches uh, of other sorts work the same way. I'm able to sort of build build up all these different instructions. The uh, the the dot s instructions are for single precision floating point, and they uh, also have a nice structure to them as well. Um, and um, and so 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 that that gives me the the core of my assembler. Um, I, I talked about this a little bit last time, and this is one of the things I built up as a prerequisite. To do code wor words in this platform, I have to, uh, because we're building out of C, uh, and C hides away the uh, the structure of, or sorry, the, the, the registers that are chosen uh, for different uh, uh, components of the, the fourth system, um, I, I need a transition point to get a stable ABI, to call from C into my, into my, uh, code words because I don't know uh, where the top of stack or where the stack pointer will be uh, b based on where the C compiler compiles the variables that make up uh, ESP32 forth. Um, but what I can do is use a trick that I, I believe it, um, there's a, it's some of the G4 folks, something like that, uh, I think is, is where I first saw this. But the idea is that you call in uh, to a particular C signature and that gives you a stable uh, binary interface. Um, one other thing I have to work around, by the way, um, on ESP32 is that not all memory can be uh, contain machine code. And so um, I, I have to also manage uh, a separate uh, a, a secondary heap for um, uh, putting code because uh, you have to allocate a special chunk of memory for it. Um, and uh, at the moment, I've, I've only, for the, assemble, for the code words, I've only got ESP32 and Linux support. And this, uh, I need to get rid of this uh, value, but the, the assembler is not coming soon. It is, it is here now. So you can define a code word um, and, and uh, encode. And if you want to uh, assemble bytes yourself, you can do that with these code one, two, three words. And 
um, see here and see a lot are, are to manage that uh, that code uh, memory space. Um, and then the the uh, entry point I was mentioning uh, looks like this. You've got a uh, a call into uh, uh, a function that you you need to implement in machine code that uh, takes the uh, stack pointer as an input and returns the stack pointer as a as an output. It does this after the top of stack has been stashed away on top of the stack. So there's no separation of the top of stack. It's just a uh, an all in memory stack. And then an, the address of the floating uh, of a location that contains the floating point. Uh, top of stack is also passed in. Um, the reason for this indirection is that most uh, most cases you would not actually want to touch that value, and so this avoids uh, words that don't want to do anything with a floating point stack can just ignore this. And then on each of the different CPUs, there's a well-defined uh, calling convention. So uh, you know the data stack will using this sig signature comes in an RDI and then has to be passed out on RAX on on x64. Uh, then the stack pointer goes in, in, in RSI, and there's a similar convention on each of the, the different uh, uh, CPU types. Um, and, and this is all that had to be added sort of to the core of the system to, to, to provide um, that, that definition of a code word. Um, and you can, of course, uh, assemble in, in bytes directly like this, like I showed last time, um, but uh, and we and we have disassembly, um, but uh, and I'm going to actually skip over the internals of the definition in the interest of time. Uh, but what you end up being able to do now is uh, use the assembler and define uh, a set of uh, use use these uh, opcode shortcuts to specify the assembly code that you want to specify. So here's a definition of a uh, a version of two star that's uh, done from scratch. And um, and then you can also disassemble a word. And so for a uh, a word that a code word, the um, the position of the uh, address of the code is uh, one cell away from uh, the execution token, and you would disassemble it like this. Um, and uh, you can you can either show things in in hex or decimal. And I'll. Um, Folks, should, if you're interested in the, in the internals, uh, take a look at the implementation. It's a very small uh, small implementation. The generic parts of the assembler disassembler are only 113 lines of code. Um, for Extensa, um, I would say that I, I, it is certainly not 100% pr production ready. I have I have tried to cover all of the the major opcodes, but um, already there's a, a uh, one one email in my inbox from someone that's found at least one mistake I've made in an opcode. So uh, work in progress, but I've in about three or three or four lines of, of uh, code I've got the oh and this is a typo that should be uh, risk v five in the slides. Uh, so the risk v five uh, instructions are actually even they have an even cleaner encoding and so they fit into far fewer lines. Um, it's uh, at the uh, the bleeding edge uh, uh, version of uh, ESP32 fourth. Uh, the assembler is is built in, but it's done uh, as as lazy loaded code. So you run extensa dash assembler or risk v5 dash assembler, and then it will uh, compile and load it so it doesn't use memory uh, normally. Um, and everything is structured into a layered vocabulary. So you have sort of the fourth vocabulary. Uh, within that ASM, and then within that, either the extends at risk v5. Um, it could probably be be uh, refactored and cleaned up more. Some of the there's some words for doing uh, memory safe reads uh, that are mixed in to the the core of the assembler disassembler. Um, and um, uh, let me at this point duck out and and do a a, a small demo. Um, let's see. I will do this. Um, so just to just to give you a sense, I mean the the assembly this this is that's the that's the generic parts of the assembler, and then for example, um, the the hot off the presses RISC V five uh, disassembler, you know, lists out all of the the registers, um, has some encodings for uh, the different uh, operand types. Um, and there's there's actually a, in the in the data sheet for RISC v5 
uh, they have a very well-defined set of instruction families for the core instructions, and then I'm just able to lay out uh, an opcode table for those. And then there's, uh, I, I ended up for the 16-bit, the, the, the sort of denser encoding, uh, I, I initially tried to use the, uh, the instruction types that they called out, uh, but it actually ended up being more verbose than just listing them uh, individually. And so then, then those are listed out in that way. But let me, uh, let me actually fire up uh, a device uh, and I'm going to go ahead and do, um, and I'm gonna change which window I am sharing so that we'll see the, so this is, uh, you can see my screen. This is, uh, I, I got a, uh, an ESP32 here. Um, and um, I'm going to mostly show off the disassembler. So, for example, uh, let's take a look at, at uh, two star. And so I'm going to go into hex, and I will uh, I will disassemble the code uh, at the uh, the code that makes up the two star word. And oops, I have to first load. <laughs> uh, I have to first load the assembler, uh, and it, I initialize it one. Oopsie. Let me reboot the thing, it's probably in a bad state. And I'm gonna do load the assembler and let's try that again. So I will do two star at, um, oh, I should go into hex, uh, two star at, uh, and then I will disassemble 20 instructions. And um, the, the uh, this this particular um, uh, disassembly, the, the core of this particular uh, word is is just sitting right here. Um, it loads. So an interesting uh, thing that you you quickly will see uh, with uh, uh, poking at the internal uh, implementation is the is, is this is uh, some of the interesting choices that the C compiler makes. And so um, I I went ahead I. I previewed and, and figured out which registers are involved here. And you'll notice that um, A7 is the top of stack. And here it's doing a, a shift left on the on that top of stack. Um, A, uh, let's see, A, uh, A3 is the uh, instruction pointer. And here it's doing a load, um, a load into A12, which in uh, Brad Rodriguez's parlance is the the, the fourth W register, um, and then because this is an indirect threaded fourth, A12 then gets loaded the address or the value at, at the the address in A12 gets loaded into into A14, um, and then this is the incre the add by four uh, of of A3, which recall was the uh, was the instruction pointer, and then there's this weird jump. Why is there a jump here? Well, this is this is next, and unfortunately, um, a side effect uh, of uh, using a C compiler and using computed go to uh, is that uh, a, a, an optimization that should in, should be possible for a threaded interpreter. That uh, I know that the GeForce folks have fought back and forth with GCC and LLVM to fix, um, but consistently, what ends up happening is you get a jump to a single location. Uh, for for dispatch rather than uh, inlining what what actually goes there, which is the, just this single instruction, which is an, a a jump uh, through a register, so a jump through a fourteen that that uh, uh, for uh, what Brad Rigers calls the X register in fourth. So it's very odd that unfortunately each um, each uh, word uh, of the in the core words has this extra uh, indirection, and it, I believe it's there just because the uh, the C compiler is not able to optimize uh, in, in this particular way because it, it isn't uh, fit into its structured flow control. Um, and, and you'll notice, like you can tell that this is the next instruction and the next instruction, and so you, you can go so, and look so, at. Brad, you are you are thinking. You are thinking in a in a new optimization for ESP thirty two force. But potentially, although I think the cha the challenge is that um, as long as we sort of have the C compiler in the mix, it's it's very hard to coax it to uh, 
to to in, to uh, inline that particular uh, instruction. It uh, uh, I know that the, there's uh, threads back and forth with the G fourth folks where they they also try to convince the GCC folks that this is an important optimization not to break because it affects any. Uh, 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 and uh, would you be able to patch this? After after the binary is is ready is is loaded perhaps that's an it's an interesting idea you could imagine yeah going through and um, there's there's actually a, a enough bytes at the position uh, that this jump goes to just inline uh, the the bytes of the jump instruction and so it it's a fair point it might be possible to to uh, back patch it another path would be you know obviously a native a native uh, Fourth would uh, avoid this, but of course that's a that's a big hurdle to 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 get to. Um, let's see. Um, the um, uh, let me let me briefly uh, show off. Uh, actually, let's see. So so you can do this this sort of disassembly if you want to go poking around in the internals of of the system. Uh, this is a great way to sort of figure out what's going on. Um, you know, here's here's the XOR instruction, and we can yet again we see that jump at the bottom, uh, and, and here's that here's that XOR. Um, if you take a word like uh, pin mode and uh, do that disassembly, um, here you'll see this call uh, call eight instruction, and here it's doing a call into uh, a word that is uh, or sorry into a, a C function, and so that's actually you know, this is the extent of the word here down to this jump. And in some sense, it is actually kind of nice that there's that final jump. You're able to quickly spot the, the next word there. Um, but, uh, uh, and so you, at this point, you know, you, you're transitioning into, uh, here's the entry point, and now we're deep into the, the C code for, for pin mode and, and all of that. Woo, and I just pasted all of that into the terminal. Um, let me, uh, in, in the interest of, Mostly showing off. I'm going to I'm going to show off the RISC-V5 one because that literally got uh, to the point of uh, working uh, just uh, just last night, and so I will quickly splash that on on the screen. Uh, I need to switch to. I've plugged it into a different uh, a different board in, and let me. Screen share that, and it, it's an interesting facet of uh, of uh, you know poking at the the system at this level is that up until now it hasn't mattered mattered particularly which uh, version of VSP uh, which version of VSP thirty two you have, but if you're doing low level assembly, of course now now there's two different instruction sets, and actually three because the um, the ESP32 S S3, I believe it is, uses uh, the LX7 Extensa instruction set. So it has yet a slightly different version of the Extensa instruction set. But I, I believe that one is fairly close to what's used in the, in the regular ESP32. So here again, I've, I've loaded the, um, the RISC uh, V5 uh, assembler. And uh, let's take a look at two star. And I will, I will, uh, so I should, let me go into hex because it's easier to see things in. And then um, I'll get the address of it and disassemble uh, 10 bytes. And yet again, um, there's uh, sort of this uh, lack of an optimization. So here's the extent of the word. And uh, you, you can see a similar, similar choice of code layout. So x25 here. Is the uh, top of stack, and uh, I believe it uh, notes in this. The instruction pointer is in X twenty three, and then it's you know doing the load into into W, and then the load into X, and then uh, and then there's the the increment of the uh, of the instruction pointer in X twenty three, and then yet again here is that. Uh, JAL is a jump and link instruction, uh, and it uses it, it can have an offset. And if you use a zero offset, then this becomes a relative jump. Um, and so, if we disassemble uh, that uh, that address, 
we see, and this is this is actually a, a thing I need to, a bug slash issue I need to fix with a disassembler, which is right now, if there are multiple encodings that are, uh, decodings that are possible uh, for an instruction, it doesn't disambiguate which of them to use. And uh, it happens that a, uh, an in, a, a, a jump through a register, an address in a register gets encoded as a move um, uh, of that register to zero. And so uh, we're getting both the disassembly for that interpretation of the instruction, which is, is wrong, and the correct interpretation, which is that this is a, uh, a, a jump through a register. That the, the C dot is because this is the compact or 16-bit decoding. And so yet again, uh, the, uh, the, that nec definition of next, uh, or at least not, not actually the entirety of next, but the last little step in next, uh, got moved to a, a shared address uh, shared between each of the different uh, separate uh, word definitions. Um, so with that, are there are there any questions? Um, I actually let me I, I did have one other slide. Let me quickly jump back to the slides. Um, I may uh, so I, I've got a few certainly a few missing opcodes, and I think there are some places where the operands don't do proper uh, decoding of some of the immediates. Um, I'm still actually missing for both of the two instruction sets that I support right now, uh, support for uh, structured flow control words. So you can compile in explicitly jumps and, and, and calls and so on, but you can't do uh, structured loops, which is usually what you do in a fourth assembler. Um, I need far better tests. Uh, uh, and, and the fact that I'm getting emails from folks uh, mentioning uh, errors in the in the assembler uh, says that I, I've got flaws there, um, and probably it needs a little bit of cleanup. I, I am thinking about implementing x86 and x64. There are a couple of challenges uh, with uh, applying uh, this type of assembler to that type of CPU, um, partially because x, x86 uses a lot of prefixes and the the style is a little bit more sisky in in in, uh, in flavor. And so uh, there there are probably some uh, extensions I may need to add to the to the general tool to make it work well for an x86 style assembler. And and the last thought that I, I this is one that that I've gotten to wonder about, which is uh, notice that this emulation might be an interesting direction to go. Uh, if you've already defined the bit pattern, uh, all you really need to, to then describe what the instruction means to the CPU is, is to add just a little bit more code. And so uh, I, am, I am slightly tempted to explore what it would mean to, for example, emulate one of the CPUs of another um, as, a, as a potential way to expand this, this line of thought. Uh, we did the demo. Uh, are there any questions? Well, thank you very much. That was inspiring. Excellent. Interesting. Really interesting. Christian. Christian has a question. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Go ahead. Uh, from what I understood, uh, Brad, you developed three different assemblers, one for LX6, one for LX7, one for RISC? Um, so, so I only have the LX6. I haven't done the LX7 extensions. They're, it's, it's kind of an extra set of instructions on top. And so I probably will uh, fold the LX7 ones into the, the LX6 assembler and just have it be a generic extensa disassembler. The, so it's really two, two of them. <laughs> OK. And all those ESP32 uh, flavors. <laughs> there is always an RTC hidden processor used mostly in sleep mode. Mm -hmm. Does it is it treated as a a subset of the LX or RISC uh, instruction set? Or is it? I I actually don't know. I haven't I haven't investigated that facet of the chip actually. So this is the the the, the lovely thing about ESP thirty two is that they they took this Tenselica core and then they sprinkled in a bunch of different facilities. And so that real time clock feature I I have not other than I think maybe putting some bindings in for the the C interface. I haven't taken a deep enough look to know. It's a good question. Okay, so. You, now you got me curious, actually, to go <laughs> to go find out. 
We Thank have you. two more questions, one from John Maseria and next uh, from Klaus, but first, John. Mm -hmm. Yes, hi. I'm curious, what, what risk five uh, board are you working with? This is the ESP32C3. So there's a, a now a version of ESP32. And it, actually, I, I saw, I don't know if this is uh, sort of definitive, but I saw a um, some material out on the uh, out on the the web that indicated that apparently the es the, uh, the ESP32 folks uh, ha have stated that they plan to uh, sort of in the long run move to to risk v5 going forward because um, they uh, I'm assuming the reason is because the the ten the uh, extends uh, uh, they have to pay for it it's a it's a licensed uh, software core whereas risk v5 is an open source uh, uh, software core, and so they are able to incorporate it uh, at lower cost. And there's a there's now an active community of of, of folks that are uh, expanding that, and 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 so I, I suspect we'll be seeing Risk V five in in more places because it because it's it's free. So uh, so I, so I think in the in the sort of future horizons for ESP thirty two, my guess is future future generations will probably uh, go in that direction. I believe the Risk V five is probably a little bit uh, uh, f uh, fatter as a as a core because uh, on the C3 I believe they only squeeze in one core whereas they're able to fit in two cores of the the Alex uh, 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 six. Thank you. I think they oh, made an oh. announcement. I thought they made an announcement they were dropping ARM entirely. They're not making any more new ARM cores. They're all going to be risk five. I'll see if I can find the article. It's it's not. By the way, they were not on ARM previously. They were on uh, they were on uh, uh, this weird Tencelica yeah. uh, uh, Extensa instruction set, which is itself kind of a strange. Like I, this is the only context I've ever seen that one in. It's not a terrible instruction set, honestly, but it's but the Risk V five one's even nicer and cleaner. So, Klaus has a question. Yeah. Um... Brett, thank you very much for your presentation. I feel deeply impressed because I'm kind of project blind. I'm using microcore, so a real stack processor for such a long time that I forget how complicated things get with registers. This is just a nuisance. Yeah. If I look at your assembler results at your machine code, then I come to the conclusion that Force instruction seems to consume about six six uh, instructions on a risk five, let's say. Mm -hmm. Well, microcore on on ninety nanometer technology already runs at twenty five uh, mega force instructions per second. So this would mean that a risk five needs to run at least at one hundred fifty mega instructions per second. And I pretty much doubt whether it is uh, capable of fetching 125 million instructions per second. I mean, the, 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 the memory would be extremely expensive. So they have caches and so you have cache delays and whatnot. And what I would be interested in is, is a more or less simple um, benchmark program that I could use uh, to run on microcore and then get some comparison of hmm. uh, how fast microcore is compared to uh, usual risk machines. It, it, it would it would be interesting to, to, to benchmark it and compare. And I, I have to admit that like for a, 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 a threaded, uh, for an indirect threaded fourth, like the, the in, it's, it's, I'm complaining about the, 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 that one uh, extra jump in there. But aside from that extra jump, um, the the code that they're emitting versus the instruction set is about what you would do by hand. So uh, in in that sense, it's fine. I suspect that if you if I were doing a native fourth for for one of these CPUs now and wanted to get peak performance, you'd probably want to do uh, sort of more like check and try to do a uh, do a uh, a subroutine threaded fourth uh, for one of these because you're you're sort of paying quite a lot for uh, uh, all of the uh, all of the the plumbing just to do the indirect threaded piece the um uh, the although even in that kind of a setup you you would get a lot of inefficiency from the sort of shuffling back and forth uh from the stack maybe on extensa you could use that sliding window 
uh, and use the native stack for the data stack. It, it, it's possible, but I, I'm not sure it would work well because they it's really designed to be a C call frame and, and has a certain amount of transition costs. So yeah, all, all excellent points. It's a, a, a mapping forth to, to these CPUs is uh, uh, you know kind of a kind of a bad fit in certain ways. Uh, so. yeah, yeah, talking about the sliding windows, I mean, these are all constructions that are limited resources. I mean, you have 32 registers. If you need 33, you got a problem. And if, if you have a slide, so, and, and with the stack, you have uh, virtually unlimited stack depth because you could do a background process that that shoves the, the the bottom of the stack somewhere else if it if an overflow is inside more or less and so uh, yeah it's 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 a fact of history that register machines uh, became prominent uh, versus stack machines because it also turned out that rising a stack allocator for a conventional programming language to do stack allocation on a stack machine works pretty well. And it, the research, I mean, there have been four generations of attempts to do this. And after the fourth attempt, more than 90% of all local variable accesses went away and could be replaced by stack manipulation. So, yeah, it's it's history and how it went. Yeah, it's, it it's, it's, it's not it's, the most the intelligent solution. It, I think at this point, you know, especially, you know, looking at the Extensa instruction set with the sliding window, like that whole premise of how to manage registers is a is a reflection of trying to optimize the CPU for C code. If you've got a C call frame, you 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 spend a lot of effort in it. Uh, you know, in typical assembly of a C, of C code, shuffling registers on and off of stacks, and so they to 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 make that cheaper, they they do these sliding windows to try to try to sort of uh, you know li limit the 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 damage of uh, of uh, the cost of of a call, but if it were merely exposing uh, uh, some hardware stack or something like that, you would you would sidestep all of that, but then you'd you'd end up with something that looks a lot more like forks. So, yeah, it's uh, it's fascinating how it's gone, it, but but it's also it's and it's also frustrating now that so much of the the CPUs are sort of built around C in that way. <laughs> But less so for Risk Five. Risk Risk Five seems to be uh, just a little more, a little bit more vanilla. Although, but as you say, six instructions. Are there other questions? May I risk another one? Go for it. <laughs> uh, when we're going to Risk Five, are we losing any of the flexibility that was there with the LX six and seven? regarding a, all the a, peripherals and that that funny multiplexer that allows connection to almost anything so so i haven't this is one of these things where it's the the combinatoric complexity of comparing you know the 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 uh the, the original esp32 versus the s2 and the s3 and the c3 i i haven't you know sort of taken the, it, there's a lot of like subtle differences in each of them um differences in terms of like the number of serial interfaces and uh things like that so almost certainly some things have gotten left on the floor i think they changed out uh how many crypto ops they support uh there's uh one one glaring difference is that i in the c3 there's the single core uh they write that the risk v5 was big enough that they couldn't fit two of them uh, it, it, two of them in there. My my guess is that the next generation device. I think they've announced like a C six or something that's going to have two cores. So they'll yes, they'll uh, get back five. To... There is a there is a new uh, announcement for for a risk five CPU from 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 ESP. From yeah, the I think ESP they've got. Board. I think they've got a second a second one coming. That's that's got the. And I think I think that one's two core. Um, the, I think a lot of what they've called is actually stuff that they perceive as being less popular. But I I don't know if they've made good or bad choices in that. So, yeah, it's a. It's interesting because like even the the ES uh, ESP eight two six six was was also based on these Tencelica, uh chips, and it it it's an example of one where they they uh, they went with this, the the. Uh, a lighter set of options so they didn't have the floating point and they didn't have the uh 
uh, they didn't have the sliding window feature because they, that's like an option. You know, the, the interesting thing about the Tencelic, I think, is it's almost like the old IBM, uh, ma you know, mainframes with different, you know, you add the multiply as an extra option and you add the sliding window as an extra option and that kind of a thing. So, yeah, I, 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 I suspect there'll be things that they will have lost in the in the transition, Brad, but I, I don't have the Brad, list. Brad and Christian, our specialist is sleeping, is Jason in this field. He has the boss both uh, CPUs and he tested and he did the benchmarks and well he 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 ex he spent a lot of time uh, uh, experimenting with both CPUs and he was amazed at the speed of the risk five uh, even with the with the clock uh, with less clock it's mm -hmm. faster than than, 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 than silica even with one processor is faster than the, than the Tensilica. But the great advantage of having only one uh, core is uh, in power, mm. because you have much less power, but, but much, much, much less power than the Tensilica. And at some, um, at some uh, algorithms, it's faster. Yeah, uh, and, and actually, you know, you, you, it's, it's interesting you point that out because the even um, you'll notice that there's a, a slight pause parsing the assembler uh, at load, and there is a noticeable. Uh, it is noticeably faster on the on the on the RISC-V five e even with that single core. So yeah, I, I suspect there's and and one of the kind of odd wrinkles with the the Tensilica is that it has um, different program memory that are that's mapped to the flash and then has sort of this weird process to, to cache it and so the uh, i believe that that mapping is uh has a, a bunch of limitations it's sort of a, a, a not a particularly uh well well designed uh cache whereas the, the risk revive has a sort of a proper uh instruction cache backing it and so i think that another another point uh, that people should uh, bear in mind uh, is with processors. Uh, it, 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 does, it doesn't mean very much if your processor is better than the other. You need to have the supply chain. But when when uh, Expressive launched the, um, these chips, I think, I, I don't want to say something stupid. Probably we have somebody else in the me meeting that knows better, but I am not sure if it was in the first months, one million chips or 10 million chip, uh, chips, they, their sales. They sold that large numbers of chips and they deliver. It's not only to sell, it's they have the chips to, to deliver. And this is why you can have a much better technology, but if you don't have the chips, it doesn't mean anything. Yeah, I, I can, I can, I guess uh, to, to that other question about what's missing, I, I can at least tell you from the bindings and what I had to disable for uh, for uh, building ESP32 forth, the some of the the SD MMC support is is broken. I don't know if that's a software thing or not. There's uh, there's not the two serial interfaces. Uh, there uh, there's there's a, a, a DAX. There's no DAX on the uh, uh, the 32 uh, C3 as well as the S3, um, and there's also uh, let's see, but there is some sort of an RMT module. Yeah, those are those are the three that that jump there. Three things that jump uh, out. Atle, you have a qu question, or do you want to? No, I, I was just wondering, have you have you released this to the general public now? Can we can we start playing with it? Um, the assembler is 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 up in the the beta version of uh, on on uh, the the uh, the ESP thirty two fourth uh, website. So if you go to uh, you can you can if you, you'll have to install that that bleeding edge version, uh, which yeah. So it's it's uh, here. I'll paste the URL. It's there I'll see it and I can. Okay, thanks. It it is unfortunately undocumented. So right now you have to know to do, to type extensa dash assembler and get into that vocabulary and um you can list you know once you're in there it's in a separate vocabulary and you can view list it to see the pieces but i i've named all of the op codes mirroring the data sheet and so on so um yeah and in, in any case i can just replay this video if, if there is something that I've, if i get confused i can 
I can replay the video, your presentation now, I can just go back to it, right? And that's yes. all I will need, yeah. I Thanks. think so, yeah. Super. All right, other questions? Slowly, slowly we are, um, we are getting attention from folks from the ESP32 community. And uh, I see people interested and this assembly and this assembly can open their, their eyes to force because there is no other language in the world in the moment that is uh, interactive and inside the chip and you can disassembly code. So this is super interesting for developers of uh, operating systems and other languages also. And this can uh, expand uh, force popularity inside these groups, these large, very, very large groups of people. Yeah, a lot of other languages have the interactive access, but I know of no other language that has the sort of interactive assembler disassembler. That's and Brad, um, you mentioned in the past or in other meetings that you are implementing this assembly and disassembly, especially for artificial intelligence or machine vision. One of one of both or or both. Yeah, I'd like to take, um, um, so I, I have a ESP32 cam and I want to uh, take the images from that camera and then run some, some local processing on it. And so that's, that's sort of one of my goals is to, uh, to take a, a pre-cooked machine learning model and then run it on, on the device. Because it because the, because it does have floating point and so uh, and it's single precision float but that's that's mostly what you need for that type of thing so and this is another interesting interesting field for because there are many 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 users for uh, intelligent cameras for home application and for industrial application and this is a great field for young programmers. Tensor, tensor flow and, uh, art and, and, and machine vision for recognition for objects uh, with the ESP32 cam is so inexpensive. It's, it's ama an amazing device. Yeah, great. It's a huge um, uh, area uh, that uh, is currently running under the term edge, edge computing. So where you have really sophisticated uh, processing at the local computers in the field and only communicate the results um, um, further on. I think that's, uh, that's quite, quite interesting and uh, it's great that FOSS can contrib contribute there. Yeah, nice. So other questions? Oh, what what okay. happens with Howard? Howard, are you are you quiet? Are you uh, too busy? What happens with you? We we want. I've to... been I've been very busy indeed. Uh, connecting to a CAN bus on an electric vehicle and trying to work out what the CAN signals mean and why it was failing to get flashed, etc. So I'm calming down now, but I haven't had time to do anything. But uh, um, if there is. A five minute slot, um, hopefully five minutes of real time, not five minutes of Howard as programmer time. Um, I would like to advertise my Colorforth archive. That would be um, an okay thing to do. Okay. Yeah, go, go ahead. Okay, I'll just very quickly share my screen. And I can paste in that. <clears throat> Uh, right. Okay. Can you all see the the Colorforth archive there? Yeah. And I'll just I'll just uh, paste that in the chat so people can click on it. And. <clears throat> 
Okay, um, <clears throat> what happened is I got a question uh, from a guy, have I got Chuck Moore's original code? And I said, well, yes, I have somewhere. And <clears throat> I've got my Colorforth archive sits on my laptop uh, archived under Dropbox, <clears throat> but it took a while to find it. So I got into tidying everything up and I, um, <clears throat> Um, there was, I think, 4,000 files in my archive. So what I did is I copied them onto my Inventio software website <clears throat> and have done a link. So if anyone's interested, it's all there. You can even link to the latest uh, stuff here and some other links here. Um, I also wanted to comment on the, this thing. Well, while I was... Um, digging up Chuck's original code and uh, getting his original website to work, I came across this page and it's kind of hidden in the system. And I, I do recall having seen it, you know, 15, 20 years ago, whatever. Um, but this is a totally brilliant um, explanation of fourth in, in one page. I, I, I won't go through it all now. Um, but he talks about, well, edit time, compile time, run time. And he talks about floating point, why he doesn't like it. Uh, don't do conditional compilations and portability. Do not try and hide the hardware, basically. <clears throat> anyway, I just thought that was a really excellent page. Um, the other thing I'd like to share, have I got time? Mm -hmm. OK. Um, if you look at my, <clears throat> my archive here, You'll see that it's, um, it, what, what do you do? You, you just click somewhere. Um, I don't know if Albert's in the meeting, uh, but this is, this is his archive that I got from him over the years. So you can click back up. <clears throat> I'd just like to explain how this works um, because there's numerous ways you can do this. This is, this is HTML produced by PHP. So even though it's not, written in fourth as such, I think the approach is, is a very fourth-like approach. So if I can share my um, <clears throat> my files, so if I could find it. Just need to go back and into the Colorforth archive. So what do you have? This is the um, local copy on my hard drive here for what is on my website so this is the uh, the root of the website and this is a folder for called colorforth archive so in that in normal um web pages way you've got an index.php so i just want to show show people this i i actually searched up how do you create a website that lists uh, like like a windows explorer style thing you just seen <clears throat> What's the easiest way of doing it? And I came across this uh, code from somewhere. I'm sorry, I've forgotten where it was now. And I hacked it. So it is now doing what, what I want. Uh, just very quickly, it's it's got your usual style sheet things. And for those of you who don't know anything about this, as I didn't a few years ago, um, style says, this is how I want the text that you display to appear. So if you've got, for example, um, where's a header or something? These are tables. Yes, um, header H1. So this is the the big header, and you just list font size, font weight. So every time in your code, you you have um, a header type, header one, or header two, or whatever these things are. These are the tables here, <clears throat> table row, table column, presumably, all these things. Anyway, so that's that's the usual thing. So you can make the website look pretty. You can set colors. Um, this is a whole lot of complicated stuff about indicating the file types, but the <coughs> oh, excuse me, <clears throat> the interesting thing, the code to actually produce that HTML page, um, is is um, is not that big. It's just it's just as I can see it scrolling through, and um, so all of that. It simply it, um, allows the user to interact with the with the archive, um, and to to make this work, every folder here also has an index.php in it. 
So if I go into, um, okay, here, UEFI, there isn't much here, there's just one file. And so this index.php is something that read directs with the location to the, the main complicated one, which is one folder higher. And if you go down one, um, one folder further, then you just have an extra couple of dots and a forward slash here. And so <clears throat> all you have to do to, to make a conventional file structure readable online is to add this into each folder, something like that into each subfolder, and that rather complicated index.php in the top folder. And when you open it, that's what happens. Anyway, I just thought I'd share with people a that the colorful archive exists if anyone's interested and b how the php system works there because it's a very simple way compared to the the alternatives uh, which almost always involve using somebody else's program or environment or i don't know if anyone has any ideas about how to do that in a simpler way i'd be very interested to hear it okay i think that's that's it for me about my colorful archive I say right. mine, and it's an archive of other people's colorful and mine. Very good, Howard. Fantastic. Okay. Thank you any, very much. Any, any questions? We can just, put just the comment that I, I appreciate your efforts to uh, uh, keeping track of the different versions of Colorforth. I, I periodically <laughs> go through bouts of thinking about Colorforth and, and, and looking at, looking at mm -hmm. what's out there, and it's yeah. it's an interesting <laughs> idea space. Yes, if you're interested in colorful, I would recommend that you click on the first link, um, which is my latest colorful, because as I say here, most of these don't run, because I think Chuck's uh, Chuck Moore's original is from 2001. Mm -hmm. And uh, although, well, yeah, his, uh, well, it will it will run on hardware still, actually, but you have to have a an actual floppy disk drive in there. So you're not likely to have that on a modern uh, computer with uh, <laughs> for the last 15 years, I suppose. Um, but all these others are, are of historical interest, I think. But, um, anyway, it also means that I can I can sit back now and say, if anyone's interested, there it is. Uh, there's also the entire archive here. So just if you want to grab that. And then, frankly, I'm getting old. I don't want to have to have the concern that I might drop dead or not be able to think coherently and all that is lost so it's there for anyone I, i'm very healthy at the moment I'm, i don't think i'm thinking i'm going to live for a long time yet but if there is that thought at, at, at this, this this sort of age uh, 68 now mm -hmm. very good howard um, <laughs> okay thank you mm -hmm. so much and if you can please post this on the first 2020 facebook page so many people okay. will will read it from from different countries and yeah. it's it's always interesting to get information from from uh, from people who create if not i am i am copying this uh, to, to i am i am making <laughs> a, transla a translator ah okay Oh, another another um, Bill asked me. Uh, uh, he wants to to say uh, to pass a message to the group. So go ahead, uh, Bill. Okay. Yeah. Oh, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I'd like to make one brief announcement. Uh, the Fourth Interest Group, Silicon Valley Fourth Interest Group, uh, normally meets on the fourth Saturday of the month, but in November and December, we meet on the third Saturday of the month to avoid uh, holiday periods. And so in the announcements uh, chat, I've posted our meeting announcement. It's going to be by Zoom next Saturday, starts at nine o'clock California time. We'll also be in person at Stanford. So anyone who's local can go to the Peterson building at Stanford at nine o'clock on Saturday, and it will be on Zoom and our contact information there. Chuck Moore is planning to attend. Uh, it's our premier, premier meeting of the year. It used to be we had a conference in Monterey on this weekend, and uh, now it's transitioned to be at Stanford on, again, the third Saturday of uh, November. So you're all are welcome, and the Zoom is there. Chuck will attend. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Bill. I will try to, to be with you also.
Yeah. Thanks. Now, Leon, Leon of Fourth Inc. is going to be there in person uh, doing uh, in person demonstrations. Mm -hmm. Excellent. All right. So, other announcements, other things we need to know. I think then that's the official end of the meeting. You're of course free to stay here to do some chat and uh, uh, and yeah, exchange some uh, news. Thank you very much for joining. And I think it was again a very pleasant meeting with lots of great information, surprising facts and uh, yeah. So I'm happy with it. Thank you, Ulrich. Thank you, everybody. Have a good time. Thank mm -hmm. you, Brad and Pablo and Howard. Yeah. Alvaro. Pleasure. Thanks for yeah, thanks the nice everyone. talks and